Hey! It's another episode of the Gaming Memories Podcast where I, the prophet, Sia, and the revelator, the gaming gods themselves, even me and Mother the Father, Kojima the Son, and Carmack the Holy Ghost, appeared to me and said, all the other podcasts were abominations. A little harsh, I get it. Their words, not mine. In order to bring the one true video game podcast to earth, the best video game podcast, all I had to do was interview creative and interesting people about their favorite gaming memories growing up. Today's creative and interesting guest is, drum roll please, In other words, Andrew, the heavy metal guitarist from the Mensis Ritual. I should definitely never, ever be a vocalist for a heavy metal band. But that's my attempt. I would say delete that out of pure embarrassment, but fuck it. Let my flaws appear to all. May they feel better about themselves because I am the world's biggest dumbass. Yeah. Hey, if it makes you feel better, it makes me feel better. Uh, the guest, Andrew, the guitarist from the heavy metal band or death metal or black metal. I'm probably using the wrong type of metal. Forgive me. I am only a metal hobbyist, maybe an enthusiast level. I'm not an expert. I'm not a pro. I do like the heavy, the heavy, heavy, heavy riffs. And Andrew is a legit druid master, sorcerer, alchemist extraordinaire. He writes awesome riffs. So even if you're not into heavy music, which I think a fair amount of you will not be... He's on the heavier side of the spectrum. It's it's fucking heavy. <laughs> Dude, his music is so heavy. And luckily, I also, part two, after this episode, I did another episode with the vocalist for the Mensis Ritual, Wormlord. And so we get into heavy metal vocals and how you make your voice sound way cooler. It's, it's awesome, heavy music. It is inspired by video games or they take ins inspiration from video games. Both members of the band are video game Fans, RPGs, name it, we geek out. Mensis Ritual, they have a new single coming out soon. Their first, I believe, album. It might have been an EP. Sorry for my memory. It's called Lordship, inspired by Dark Souls. Anyway, that's it. Andrew, the Mensis Ritual. All the applicable links will be in the podcast description. You guys know the drill. I say these things in the name of me, Moto the Father, Kojimi the Son, and Carmack, the Holy Ghost. Amen, and enjoy the show. Going around on TikTok, and I'm like, God damn, this is a fucking tight riff. Jugga jug, jug, jugga jug. Let me click on this guy's <laughs> profile. And I'm like, huh, the Mensis ritual. I swear I know that term from somewhere. Like, oh yeah, Mensis is uh, isn't that a bloodborne thing? I start commenting on your shit. Then I find your whole Spotify profile. You have an album called Lordship, which is all Dark Souls shit. Yeah. And it's heavy riffs and Dark Souls shit. I'm like, fuck. This gentleman, I didn't know you were a gentleman at the time. I assumed your gender, <laughs> your gender, which I think in the heavy metal scene. Well, you, like, <laughs> you were bang on. <laughs> I was like, this guy's got to get on. I don't know anything about you. I saved you giving me the spill for the podcast. How did Mensis Rituals start and why Bloodborne and all that? Basically, I needed a name for a project. I came together because me and uh, a guy I went to college with, I didn't talk to him much after college, but we sort of, um, I guess we reconnected again uh, when I, I realized that he was a big fan of the Dark Souls games. So am I. And I don't know about you, but for me, when I realized someone gets Dark Souls on that level, it's a wonderful feeling. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to nerd out about Dark Souls with you. So um, we ended up talking a lot about Dark Souls. He's also big into metal. And he uh, also started doing metal vocals after college, although I knew him as a guitar player. So I was like, hey, we got to do something. He was really sick, really sick vocalist. And uh, I was like, why, why don't we do a song about Dark Souls? And that's what it was going to be initially. It was going to be a one-off song about Dark Souls. And uh, we did it. We did like a demo. And I listened back and I was like, this is really cool. We should do more of this. 
So that's what we ended up doing. We did a full EP. We did five songs. I believe he said that that was about as much as he could stretch from the source material. He didn't want to do too many songs about Dark Souls. Uh, and the name itself, uh, I just remember playing Bloodborne for the first time and being like, that is such a dope name for a band and I'm going to take it. <laughs> and do you know what? There are, there are a number of really sick band names within these games. I think, um, I don't know if you've heard of a band called Tomb Mold. That's straight out of Bloodborne. Uh, I'm starting oh, yeah. a new band and I want to call it Soul of the Lost, which is from Demon Souls, although that might not stick. We'll see. Uh, I just find there's a, there's a wealth of like metal material within the From Software games. Also, I feel metal is quite a good fit Dark Souls lore because it is so bleak and depressing. So I, I really thought we could uh, kind of capture that vibe musically, which is what I tried to do, at least whether I succeeded. Although we're working on a follow up, but it's not about Dark Souls. We've kind of ticked that box already. But basically, love of video games, love of riffs, uh, that kind of spawned the Mensis ritual. And we did that EP. That was 2019. It was very under promoted by myself and the vocalist. Uh, I'm a lot more active on social media now than I was back then, but it's getting a bit more traction now that I've started posting on TikTok. So that's good. Yep. Your TikTok is awesome. Just daily dose of riffs. It's like, I'm, I'm down. Sign me up. Yeah. Yeah. That's the aim really. Um, I'm just, uh, there's a lot of shredders on there. Uh, I'm not true. I am a shredder. Like I can play a few solos here and there, but, uh, I don't know, I just like writing stanky riffs and sharing them, and uh, a lot of what I post will be on the album that is ideally coming out this year, although it may not, because I'm also working on another album, so I'm looking at potentially two albums from two bands this year. Uh, we'll see, though, that's a, that's a big investment there, so, <laughs> but hopefully, but otherwise, like, I don't know, I've been, I've been getting some traction on TikTok, and I've been on Instagram for like seven or eight years. And I recall basically getting nowhere with that platform and also mm -hmm. being shadow banned wrongfully. And also now I'm banned from sponsoring posts for no reason, which is not an exaggeration. I was just wrongfully banned from promotion. I feel like I can't grow on there. But the, uh, the best thing about TikTok, and I'm sure you've experienced it as well, is that if your content is decent and people are watching, it will put it out there. It's not behind yeah. a paywall like Instagram is. Instagram just seems to limit you unless you want to uh, sponsor your post, which like I said, I can't even do that anymore. So I feel like I just can't win with Instagram. So I've shifted to focusing on TikTok and I've amassed like 5,000 followers since I started back in like May time, which is, you know, um, five times the amount of followers I ever gained on Instagram. And I was posting on there for seven or eight years. So I think like the TikTok algorithm is like untapped and it seems to be it seems to give anyone a chance at getting their content seen, which is what I really enjoy about it. And on top of that, you have duets and a really good community of musicians. And I've managed to grow a lot just from collaborating with people. It's such a good platform for uh, collaboration, discovering new musicians, and uh, it's really opened up some doors for me. And uh, I never thought I would say that because I initially wrote TikTok off as a kid's app. And I was like, mm -hmm. why would I waste my time on there? Yep. But um, I actually think it's one of the best ways a musician can grow now, at least in my experience. I see a lot of people do well on Instagram. For whatever reason, I cannot get that traction on Instagram. So I've got to go with what works for me, and that's TikTok. It's also just a, a good distraction, I find. I spend a lot of time just scrolling through my For You page, and I you know, genuinely find some good stuff on there. So Yeah, I've been preaching the, the TikTok gospel for a while. Um, I, I had the same experience. I was just like, it's just kids dancing. Why would I, why would I be interested in that? I'm not exactly sure what put me over the edge, but during lockdown, I was just gaming for fun and doing the podcasts. I had, and normally I train in the evenings, usually jujitsu or MMA type stuff. And that all got shut down. I had nothing to do. So I started making videos and I started posting them both on Instagram and TikTok and Instagram went nowhere and the TikTok started blowing up. And then it was like, oh, people like the podcast. And again, you start, like you said, you it's algorithm probably because it's spying on every aspect of your life. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> it knows what you like. That is also why I wrote it off initially. There were like security concerns there yes. as well. But eventually I was like, you know what? Fuck I think it. there is some legitimate concerns with security and data and how your data is being used. I think that's a bigger problem. But mm. putting that aside, I agree. Like it started figuring out what I like and it's, it's figured out I like riffs, which is why I found you. You know what I mean? I found you because you were on my four year page which is a testament to exactly what you're talking about. 
It's like, yeah. oh, you like video games? You like metal? You like MMA? Like it's, all the shit I like, it's just it. It just leaving. knows. It just figures it out over time, and then I start finding legit. I found so many musicians, podcast guests, content creators that I would have never found through any other channel. Yeah. So I yeah, I quite enjoy it. Yeah, it's it's genuinely uh, changed uh, the game for me, or at least opened up a lot of doors. You know, like I say, I was uh, on an uphill battle with Instagram for years, and I was just like. Basically just treating it as a hobby, which it very much still is. But now that I'm actually getting somewhat of a decent reception, I mean, it's all relative. It's still not it's hundreds progress. of thousands of views. Yeah. yeah, it's progress. And it's it's really awesome. And it's got to be the platform, right? Because I post the same stuff on Instagram as I do TikTok. And yet on one platform, I can get 10,000 views and a lot of positive comments. And on Instagram... I just get nothing, nothing. and yeah. it's it's the same content. But I also feel like perhaps the bar is a bit lower on TikTok as well, at least from what I've seen. Like uh, for, for a time, I was like, the only way I'm going to grow on Instagram is if I do the whole like, you know, professional camera, lighting, multi-shot, yes. edited videos, which I was considering for a time. Like my videos have a low production quality, I guess you'd say, but it's not really the point. The video is not really the focus. I'm just nope. sharing my ideas. And it's awesome that I can get the reception that I've got just from posting on there. I do think maybe as TikTok, I mean, from what I understand, part of the magic is it's still in the early phase. A lot of social medias, from what I heard, Instagram was awesome back in the day. It was much more fair. Then it gets more competitive. You start having demand meet supply. And then maybe these professional videos that might be 10, five years down the road, what it takes to stand out. I don't know how long that process will take or if TikTok will turn sour. It probably will. Probably start running ads eventually and then having pay for blah, blah, blah. And start throttling you. That seems to be the the life cycle of all of these platforms. I'm hope, Hopefully it doesn't happen. What I found works for me, at least with the content I make, is in an attempt to somewhat game the algorithm, uh, posing a question works really well for me because then you'll get answers and also uh, comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rate my riff is an opportunity for people to comment and also it brings a lot of hate out of the woodwork and those people just boost your, you know, interaction. Give the power and the hater to me. <laughs> exactly. It's, you're kind of just gaming the algorithm at that point. Yeah, I've yeah, realised yeah. that negative attention is attention. Not that I get a lot of it. I don't really. I don't really pay any attention to it. But um, I've noticed a lot of people. Uh, will take that opportunity to criticize you uh, where possible. And I just try to pl play into that to some extent because it works really. But also I can't necessarily predict whether a post is going to do well or not because uh, the algorithm, for me anyway, I've had posts that I'm like, this will bang and it doesn't. And then I've had posts that go, you know, they do really well. And I'm like, I don't really understand what I've done differently here. Like maybe it's the time of day or the choice of hashtags, yeah. although I try to be consistent there. I don't know. Um, I don't post a lot though. I think I post maybe once or twice a week. And I know a lot of people say post three times a day. No, I can't really much. get riffs out at no. that momentum. Also like priority is to post cool stuff, cool riffs, interesting, unique riffs or unique to a, to a degree. You know, I write death metal, so... There's nothing really untapped there in terms of like, I'm not doing anything overly original. You know, I'm trying to write interesting stuff. I'm getting a good response, but basically I do it for fun. And when I post, I don't really have any expectations. Otherwise I set myself up to be disappointed, you know? Yeah. When it comes to the, the Lordship EP, a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One, for yep. those, I'll have a, in the intro, I normally have a song, but if I have a musical guest on, I'll swap out the song for one of your tracks. I already know what I'm going to put. Is it ho hopeless? It's hopeless. Like, hopeless, yes. The yeah, breakdown yeah. and hopeless. Fucking hey. Yeah. I was on my way to jujitsu, just like, oh, I'm going to destroy. <laughs> ah! That is the, the single heaviest moment in all of that um, record. Yeah. Yeah. That was like, okay, this guy knows how to go heavy. And uh, I highly recommend it to anyone who likes heavy music. I would disagree with your vocalist that you were stretching. I think there's enough lore in Dark Souls for like 27 albums. So I wanted to know how did you guys kind of decide what to pick and what to write around and how did that process go? How did you, like what parts of Dark Souls, the lore and that you agreed on? How did that, cause like, for example, I make music, uh, all the song names I'm working on with my brother right now are also Bloodborne terms. I have, That's sick. I, awesome. I have, o, I have Oedin. I've been making songs. They're like working titles. I think we'll keep some of them, but I just like, basically when I'm coming up with working titles for songs and I'm, and I'm, we're trying to make a darker 
like darker tonal palette. Yeah. And so everything I'm using for working titles, I'm like going through like Bloodborne on, oh, it's a fucking cool last name, but BTS, like, oh, she's the old one. Yeah, that boss fight was dope. Okay, that's the working title for this. And it kind of puts my head into a space of like, this is where I'm going. This is yep. the aesthetic that I'm heading for. I wanted to know like how that how that came together and how you how you guys decided what you were gonna to pay homage to in Dark Souls. So lyrically, I mostly left that up to the vocalist because that's kind of his domain. And uh, I have, a, I would say, a very basic knowledge of Dark Souls lore, although I've watched a lot of Varty Vidya videos. So, that's, you know, as much as most anyone. Most of us, that's what we know. Yeah. Yes. He is essential if you want to have any kind of understanding, I feel. I'm not very good at reading between the lines. Like I was saying earlier, how it started is, you know, we're just going to do a song. Uh, I believe that was the last track on the EP, Whispering Void which kind of is about Dark Souls on the whole. It's about the uh, undead curse and, you know, dying and respawning. Although, not literally. I think he had a very good approach to it. Like, he was writing about the lore, but it wasn't on the nose. And uh, I'm not going to throw shade at other bands or musicians because, like, writing about Dark Souls is not a unique thing. There have been many bands to do it before us and since. But I feel like there are bands that are a bit too literal and on the nose with uh, what they're singing about, which is fine, but um, I definitely wanted a more subtle approach to the lore. So basically, it doesn't dig too deep into the lore. It's more about the themes mm. of Dark Souls, um, you know, the the cycle perpetuating the cycle of the chosen undead, the way that, you know, you usher in an age of dark or the cycle continues and it's like two shitty options, really. We're just trying to encapsulate the themes of Dark Souls as opposed to write, you know, about the more specific aspects mm. of the lore, like Gwyn and his four knights. That's not the approach we went down. However, there is a song on there that is about Manus, um, although he's never mentioned by name. That's another thing. Like, what I really enjoy about it is if you're a Dark Souls fan and you know the lore, you can read these lyrics and you'll get some, uh, you know, there'll be meaning there and you'll understand it, but it's not so on the nose yes. that it's just spelling out the lore. So I, I guess that's what we tried to do. Like I say, I didn't have um, a say in putting together the lyrics. I left that to him. I, I did all the music myself, but I trusted that um, he had a good understanding of what Dark Souls lore means to him, and obviously so much of it is up to interpretation. Yeah. So he picked the themes that really resonated with him and the aspects of the lore, like the song about Manus. I think the the first song, Feed the Swamp, is just about the world being in decay and ruin and just being fucked beyond repair, basically. Hopeless, again, that kind of just encapsulates uh, the, the perpetuating the cycle. Game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, on a meta, meta level, like the feeling of playing Dark Souls... And feeling, you know, you're alone, against... Alone, just... Yeah. Just, yeah, you're, you're alone, like, you're facing, I don't want to say insurmountable odds, but it's such an impressive, bleak game. Yes. Like, I would implore anyone to play it if you haven't already. It really resonated me with me in a way where it just made sense to try and do something musically with the lore. Like I say, it's not a unique idea. I just feel like... It needed something dark and oppressive and heavy, and that's kind of what we did with Lordship. Although I struggle to listen to that EP now because um, I'm conditioned to hate everything I've ever written. Yeah, this this is the way we all. When people ask me yes. like, "Oh, you make beats?" It's like, "Do you have stuff on Spotify?" Yeah, but how about you just wait till my new shit comes out under a new alias? Because I don't want to. I'm just embarrassed. Yeah it's, yeah, it's weird. For example, like in light of getting more exposure on TikTok, I feel like I'm underselling myself telling people to check out this EP because it's, you know, it was recorded in 2018 and I feel like I've stepped up a lot since then. The production is good. I was going to ask you, by the way, are the drums all like digital Stephen Slate or did you, they sound uh, like you programmed the drums, right? So I didn't mix it. I don't know exactly what samples were used, but they were programmed. So mm. I tracked all the guitars in this room. Uh, the bass is all programmed too. Mm, interesting. That's something I do a lot of. All my TikToks, all the bass is programmed. No one's ever it's noticed. It's pretty good. The um, That's the nice thing about super heavy drums. It still sounded natural. I mean, I play drums, and so it's like, okay, these are programmed drums. But programmed drums are their own art form. And I liked it. Like, I thought your whole EP, I thought the production was pretty solid. It's heavy. It's fucking heavy. And in my truck, my truck doesn't have a great sound system. It sounded good in my truck. A lot of things sound like shit in my truck, so... 
basically we recorded it on a very modest budget with a friend of mine called Adam Cox. Uh, he's a wizard and he's, you know, only improved since then. And I think it's, it sounds really polished and good relative to what it was, which was me and my friend writing some riffs about Dark Souls. But I'm hoping the follow-up will be a step up in that regard. I have to ask though, like I wrote the drum parts. I'm not a drummer. I write guitar drums. That's what I call them because they basically, basically the kick always follows the riff. And then I write these fills that I don't know if a drummer would ever write them. I'm trying to get better with drum parts. I kind of stick to simple stuff, but yeah, I wrote all the drums on there. I think that's one of the aspects where it doesn't quite land, but I would say that because I'm not a drummer and hopefully in the future I could at least get maybe a drummer to just help me with tweaking some MIDI. I would always be, I mean, I'd be happy to help you in that regard anyway. I don't remember anything specific. Uh, a lot of times because when I'm, as a drummer listening to riff music, I'm listening to the shit I can't make. I can't, I wish I could play riffs because I have a thousand in my head. I've just never mm-hmm. learned how to play the guitar. So when I listen to that riff music, I'm not listening for the drums. I'm listening, are these riffs tasty or they are not? Like that's, and so I don't remember anything standing out that was like a that didn't feel natural or like not real or I mean, you can tell it's programmed just because of just the dynamics. Like no drums sound that perfect. It just like, they just don't sound that good. Yeah. It's all quantized. Yeah. But for that type of music, when it needs to hit and you're taking up so much of the frequency space in the mids with the guitars and everything, it's like, that's not the type of music you're listening a lot for other than maybe an interesting pattern. You're yeah. not, you know, it's, that's, the, the drums are definitely uh, lower tier or lower priority in that type of music. So it doesn't, I don't remember anything that felt, um, and I don't remember any patterns that felt wrong or off or didn't flow. It was all in service of the riff, which for that music, I mean, everything funnels like we're, we're at, we're worshiping, up, we're worshiping at the altar of the riff for this type of music. Yeah. So as long as it serves that, I thought you did. Well, I mean, dude, there's a reason why I asked you to get on the podcast. I was like, fuck, it's about dark souls and it's fucking good. <laughs> I legitimately Thank liked you. it. So, um, I, I mean, I'm excited for the next one. W- was there anything specific like about the game that you leaned on or thought about to try to take inspiration when writing riffs? Or was it was just, I have a theme in my head and then I'm going for it? So, I, I guess to give you some context for my relationship with Dark Souls, I was a YouTuber, still am, to, technically, although I haven't posted in a while. Um, I used to do video game metal covers, Uh, and I did a lot of Dark Souls covers. So Dark Souls and Riffs have been intertwined for a long time now. I believe I was the first person on YouTube to ever do a cover of Dark Souls in a metal style. This would have been back like 2012, maybe the year after the game came out. Over the course of like maybe eight years, although I wasn't active the entire time, I covered maybe 12 or 13 songs from uh, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3. And that's kind of, that was kind of my primary focus for a while, although I don't do that anymore. I've always had like a relationship with Dark Souls and riffs and where it's like orchestral music, um, it's not easily translated to guitar. So I found that Dark Souls music really helped me creatively come up with really interesting guitar parts. So I'll have to um, send you some stuff at some point. I, I, did, I did a number of songs, some of the riffs there, like, are really cool because I'm working with all these really strange melodies that are like... So you're saying the process of trying to translate this orchestral music to to riffs helps you start coming up with stuff you would have never... You would have never figured out had you not been trying to like translate this stuff over to guitar. I think it just made me a better musician overall. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also opened up a lot of doors for me just creatively. I was, you know, listening to really strange melodies in video game music and being like, how can I translate this to something cool? And what I used to do is I take like the the lead melody, so to speak, and then I just write a unique riff underneath uh, as long as it was serving the melody. And uh, they were very transformative in nature. They weren't note for note covers. I made a lot of changes. I would add solos and breakdowns. Um, And it was really, really cool. Not to say that the approach then, uh, you know, lent itself to working on the Mensis ritual, but I just think it was crucial in my journey in just becoming a better musician and a better songwriter. And it just really opened me up creatively in a way that when I was ready to do Lordship, I just, you know, I felt like I could. And musically, 
basically the the brief was just right heavy bleak sounding riffs that kind of match the tone of dark souls which is like oppressive bleak depressing miserable <laughs> although i know that there are bands that, like for example like it would probably suit better maybe like an ambient suicidal black metal band although that's not what i do not what i'm interested in but i guess i kind of gauged what the interest was in like dark souls metal and i, I had um a fair following on youtube back in the day and a lot of people that enjoyed what i did so i was like there is crossover here it is one of those things a lot of if you like dark souls there's a good chance you like metal so coming at it from that angle it's just a really simple fit really but um the whole Dark Souls aspect of everything was never something that I particularly mentioned or, you know, it wasn't marketed as such. Like I said earlier, it was under-promoted mm. so badly by myself and my friend. We didn't know what we were doing, and that's definitely something that I need to work on moving forward with the next album. But yeah, like, just Metal and Dark Souls, it just it just worked really well. And, you know, I, I've been for a long time trying to find a uh, way to release something independently myself under a name. And that was a good fit. And, you know, the name is from Bloodborne. And for a time I was like, we're named after Bloodborne. The EP is about Dark Souls. Is that a bit much? Is that a bit confusing? But it doesn't really matter. It's a cool name and the name will persist, you know, into other materials. I don't well. think so at all. For me as a fan, it was like previous alias. I recorded music or made released beats under. I would always put Easter eggs either samples or call outs or melodies names everything is like i didn't want it to be obvious but i wanted if someone was a video game head to be like oh i get what he's doing here i see it that's how i felt like i knew mensis ritual and then i when i saw it we were uh tiktok messaging back and forth and i saw lordship and you mentioned dark souls i probably would have figured it out like 15 20 minutes in anyway just based yeah. on the song titles and like, okay, the bands is, I don't think it's too much at all. I think it's cool when I like your approach of not being a full on hit the nose on the head, but we're, it's almost like Easter eggs. We're letting you know that aside from the fact that we like writing fucking heavy riffs, we also like video games and like they're, yeah. they're intermixed and it's just not like, I, I assumed I'm going to have a good time talking to this guy because if it's, the riffs and he likes for video game. Yeah. There's a good chance. Like you said, if someone likes dark souls, there's a good chance they like metal. Oh, this guy has two overlapping areas of interest. There's a good chance. I would have an enjoyable conversation with him. Oh, without and, a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just, I think you should definitely keep doing what you're doing. I, uh, I'm excited for when's the new album you said this year for the new Mensis ritual album. Ideally. Yeah. Whether that actually happens. Um, basically I'm starting a new job soon. So I'm going to have a significantly less time than I have now. And like I said, I was also working on another project. I kind of got sidetracked. I think I hit a wall with Mensis. So I started something else and that's come really naturally. So I had to ride that wave. Mm. And we've got like eight songs recorded, just looking for a singer, basically. It's similar stuff. I'd say it's like what Mensis does, but more new metal, hardcore Okay. A bit more modern sounding, I guess. But, you know, I wrote it. So there is some crossover there. Uh, ideally, it would be this year. Uh, and it's not a, it's not about Dark Souls. It's about... Can I say? I can say. Um, it's called K-Night. And it's about Ooh. Grendel from uh, Beowulf. Uh, based on a book called Grendel by John Gardner, I believe. I have not read it myself. Uh, but my vocalist has. So it's a concept album. That's the plan anyway, very early days um, vocally. Uh, but we should have a single out in the next few months. Uh, we're just recording the vocals at the moment, so that's exciting. But yeah, we, we weren't going to write about video games forever because Matt has a lot more things to say, I suppose. And, and you know, he this book more holds a lot of meaning to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the video game thing was kind of like a one-off. I know there are bands that dedicate their entire career to writing about games. And he's also like massively into Morrowind, so I'm sure if... We wanted to do something about Morrowind. He would be all over it, but um, I've never played it, to be honest with you. Like, and I didn't, you know, didn't play it when it was new, so I can't imagine I'd get on with it nowadays. You know. Speaking of what you did play, have you always been a gamer, or is, is kind of Bloodborne, Dark Souls, like one of the few things you got into? So I grew up with games. Like, I played a lot of games as a kid. I, I was spoiled, to be fair. I had a N sixty four and a PS1, played a lot of games. I was into my platformers, shooters. But I remember around about the time I went to college, about the age of 16, 
I really fell off from gaming because I was like socializing more and I, I was getting into bands and playing guitar a lot more. Um, and I kind of just stopped gaming for a few years. Uh, and it's another reason why Dark Souls holds like a special place in my heart is that it was the game to kind of get me hooked on gaming again to kind of realize the potential of video games again. Like no game had really captured me. And it's interesting as well because the first time I tried Dark Souls, I actually quit. I rage quit and I <laughs> traded the game in. And I was like, no more. This game is bullshit. It's obnoxious. It's unfair. I hated it. But I'd never played anything like it. I was never like a good gamer. Uh, as, a, as a kid, I just was familiar with games. But I think Dark Souls is one of those games you have to respect it. And, you know, I'd never played it before. Never played any game like it. There really wasn't much like it at the time other than Demon's Souls. But um, so I tried Dark Souls and the re recommendation of a friend of mine and I hated it. I traded it in and he was like, why don't, you, why don't you try Demon Souls? It's a bit easier. And I was like, okay, I'll give Demon Souls a go. And what I did is I cheesed the entire game with magic because it's busted in that game. Like you can trivialize the entire game. So I did that with no shame. But in doing so, I kind of fell in love with like the aesthetics, the world design, the lore. The whole package, that was kind of my introduction to the series in a, in a serious manner rather than just, you know, rage quitting. Because of that, I, I think I got the Platinum Trophy in Demon's Souls. I like no life. It's very exploitable. And if it wasn't, I don't know if I would be such a fan of the Souls games. But, you know, I beat Demon's Souls. I went back to Dark Souls and it clicked for me. I finally got it. I, you know, the thing is, it's, it's quite hard to understand the mechanics of Dark Souls if you're not familiar with it. Like, uh, I guess I treated it somewhat like Devil May Cry or like some kind of hack and slash. And it's yeah. not that. You have to be patient. You have to be observant. You have to be slow. Uh, you have to think about what you're going to do. You have to observe enemy attack patterns and stuff. And it's, it was all just so alien to me at the time. But, um, you know, eventually I went back to it. And since then, I've just been obsessed with that from software games for the most part. Um, you know, Dark Souls 1, 2, 3. Bloodborne's probably my favorite of them all. Sekiro I liked, although didn't grab me like the others, I think, because it's not really an RPG. It's more of an action game. Obviously, Elden Ring soon, which uh, is probably the next game that I obsess over. So stoked on that for sure. Yeah, Elden Ring, uh, I'm planning on... You know, my brother and I uh, bond also over video games it, besides music. He has a whole he has a whole week taken off of PTO for Elden Ring. He's been planning. He goes, he was angry when they pushed the date back because he had already got his time off and he had to like rework. Oh, and, like, fuck yeah. Trade, yeah. trade some time. Like, he's, well, we're, I'm really stoked for that game. Curious, when you first played, after cheesing Demon Souls, when you first played Dark Souls, what build did you have? So I went with a, a magic build because it completely trivialized Demon Souls. So your Souls. first time playing Dark Souls and you went magic build. It was a mage. It was okay. a magic build because I realized uh, being able to cheese things from a distance. Is a um, big deal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it just made the whole thing surmountable for me. And so I finished it as a magic playthrough. And although it's uh, it's strong in Dark Souls, it's not completely busted. I had to get good to a degree. Um, after that, I was like, right, I'm going to try sword and board melee, sword and shield. And I just started to understand the game more, how to approach situations. And obviously, once you've beaten the game once, you kind of know all the tricks, mm -hmm. everything that's going to throw at you. And then I was hooked from that point onwards. And I just make build after build. And, you know, I'd actually say I'm quite competent at the Dark Souls games now. Uh, I'm not amazing, but I, I, I get by. I've beaten all of the uh, modern From Software games dozens of times. It's strange as well. I never considered myself to be good. Still wouldn't. I don't know. Something really clicked with Dark Souls. I just, it's just the whole package, man. I, I could literally uh, talk about Dark Souls for hours, and I have done. I, I did a <laughs> Let's Play of Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 on my YouTube channel. And that's what I did. I just obsessed over those games. And they've kind of ruined other games for me because I keep looking for something to scratch that itch. But there isn't much out there that does it for me. There's a lot of Souls clones or Souls likes. Some are really good. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them just don't really do it for me. I've been trying to play a few games over the last few months, but I keep bouncing off of them because nothing seems to grab me. It's probably a me problem. That, no, you know, that's, that's very normal. For, I think maybe because there's some similarities in art, music or art, whatever. I try lots of games and I would say one to two a year. 
get I, I get sucked in. I'm like, fuck yeah, I get the magic. Mm. I bounce off quite a bit too, or I'll bounce off it two or three times, and then two years later, I'll try it again. And oh, okay, for whatever reason, the timing is right. I'm into this game. Have you played any of the Neos, Neo 1 or 2? I played Neo 1 when it launched on PlayStation 4, and I really liked it, but I have this terrible habit of... Uh, so I'll really enjoy a game, I'll obsess over it for a while, and then for whatever reason, life will get in the way, and I won't play it for a few days, and then it the becomes... Momentum, you're done. Yeah, yep. and then yeah, I'm just... Yeah, yeah. I can't go back yep. to it, it's I'm been too way. long. Uh, and I do that with so many games now. <laughs> I'll have like a, a few days where I'm like, this is the game... I'm going to play this game and it's going to be dope. And quite often, uh, for whatever reason, you know, I'll, I'll be busy or working or tired. Um, I just won't play. And then it kind of just, you know, I never go back to it. And there's been a number of games where I've must have played like the first few hours, like dozens of times now, because I like it, but I always bounce off of it. And then six months down the line, I'll try again. Something I've been trying to sort of come to terms with recently though is that you know i i'm i don't like every game and that's okay there are a number of games that i just have never managed to get on with for whatever reason and i feel like if you pay too much attention to what people are saying this might be controversial um but these are two games that i couldn't really get on with and I, they're highly praised the witcher 3 didn't do it for me and god of war 2018 again Bounced off that hard. Didn't really like it. I can it. live and with The Witcher. I can live with that. I love that game. But God, of, I'm replaying it on PC. I am tempted. Here's the thing, right? You know, I, I feel like it wouldn't be getting this level of praise for no reason. And I feel like it's it's a me problem. I'm doing something wrong. There's a reason this hasn't clicked for me. And I don't think it's bad at all. I did enjoy the combat a lot. The combat is awesome. Yeah, I, I could see yeah. maybe... If you're not, if like the the narrative doesn't, you know, like the the cinematic parts, if it's not a show you would watch outside of on TV or something, then I guess that could be a slog. Do you know? Do you have kids? No, no, no. Who see? I also might be biased because I have two kids, and something about like that kid relationship plus like the combat and the PC port is quite good. If you have a PC, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, it's a primary gaming platform. So. I think my issue is I struggle with narrative in video games. I've never managed to really give a shit. And obviously there are a few exceptions in there, but I also think it's one of the reasons why I like Souls games so much is that... I could see that. Gameplay first. What uh, narratives have you liked? You said there's a few exceptions. What are those exceptions? Probably only give you one example right now. The memory. Bioshock 1, I was Ooh. replaying that last week. And that's a good story. That is um, a good one. And I think it it just works really well with the the world building in that game. Although that game has not aged gracefully, like gameplay wise, it's a bit clunky. I think what they did with Rapture was fucking phenomenal, and you really believe it to be a living, breathing place. You know, I don't often get immersed in games. I don't watch much South Park, but it reminds me of an episode where I believe Cartman and Stan, or Stan and Kyle. Are just going through this rut where they think everything sucks and they can't really <laughs> figure out why. And I think sometimes I just get in these like slumps where uh, I'm not really engaging with things that I enjoy too much. And so I just take a break from gaming. And normally, more often than not, I just go back to one of the Souls games for another playthrough. At the moment, like uh, I don't game too much. I spend more time. Uh, writing and trying to make TikToks, that's a big push for me. So I kind of, I like to feel like I'm doing something to further my platform uh, to the point where sometimes I feel guilty for just enjoying myself, which is stupid. <laughs> like yeah. I should be allowed oh, to no. sit and have fun. I'm every having now and so then, much you know? fun. Oh, bad, but poor me. I definitely feel you on all those things. One, I do have ruts. I think a lot of people do this where most of the things I like, for whatever reason, I don't like them. And I'm just like, fuck everything. I'm just angry or down or just unmotivated. And I'll I'll uh, sometimes find something else to do. Like if I'm really down, I'll just do a lot of walking and podcasting mm. to, until something kind of clicks where I get the urge to uh, make. And then lately I've been on this thing where I'm just like cranking out beats like two a day, just like on fire. Like you mentioned earlier, when the wave comes, you got to ride the wave. And uh, I try to do the same thing. And the same thing with the podcasts and the gaming stuff. I uh, 
I don't game that often, but what I if I have a couple of good gaming sessions or a week where I'm particularly motivated with a game, I can record all of that and make TikToks for like a month and a half. And then I just have this huge backlog of footage. And then if I even if I'm not playing a game, I can go on my footage and be like, oh, that was funny when that happened on that. Or I could do something about this and hurry and try to whip out a video. Yeah, I wonder what that is. Like I've always wondered, is like the wave, the up and down of life part of the ride and there's nothing you can do about it? Or is there a way where I can like consistently be in the wave where like I'm really engaged with life and if every the music I listen to sounds better and the games I play are funner and the TV shows are doper and the sex is better and whatever. Mm. Um like or it's do I fun. have to go through the slumps? Is that like is that part of the process? Because I've never been able to get off the ride. Like my whole my I've I've sort of just tried to learn how to manage the slumps instead of trying to stop them from happening. Yeah, I think that's the only way, honestly. Being a creative person uh, you'll know this. Uh, it's it's draining, and it's not something that you can just do. I mean, you can, but it's not a switch, right? There are days where you're feeling it and days where you aren't. So perhaps that has some sway in how we engage with, like, entertainment and stuff. And I also think, like, I'm 30 years old now. I'm fucking tired all the time. <laughs> and that just has a big factor on my moods and my ability to sit there and play a game. And also, you know, like I was saying, sometimes I just feel like, should I really be sitting here playing a game? I should be working on the two albums that I want to release yes, or the next yes. TikTok video. But, you know, it's important to strike a balance. I can't say that I have struck a balance to date, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah, it's a tough one, man. Uh, I find being creative is its difficult, especially when you're always aiming to do something good and something better than whatever came before it, it's a constant struggle, which is good, right? You don't want to settle. I'm sure you feel the same way about making content. You're like, this video banged. I need something on that level, but something a bit yes. different. And I always yeah. want to be growing. You never want to feel complacent in where you are. So it's healthy to want more, but it's also really fucking hard because sometimes I'm like, I've written a really sick riff. How do I top this? So I just, I don't know. I don't know what the secret is. There isn't one really. I just, see what happens and <laughs> don't yeah. think too much about it. Just keep going forward. I mean, that's the only thing I've ever, I always just settle. like, well, what else is there to do? Like you're going to wake up and try to do better or, or what? Like what else is there to do? If you're not going to mm. wake up and like try something or learn something or get better or something like what? I mean, the only, the only thing that's come to me and maybe it's a personality is my wife tries to get on me. Like you can also just like enjoy the relationships you have with people. She's like really good at spending time with people and getting, and for me, it's like, it kind of drains me. If I have to, if I, uh, other than being like my wife, my kids and some good friends, if I have to go out and be social, I'll come home. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be holed up for four days after that. Cause I don't like that. It's just mm. like, cause I, well, I'm, I've never been quite able to put my finger on it because sometimes I can quite enjoy interacting with someone like this i enjoy the podcast every time i do a yeah, yeah. podcast and talk to someone i like leave i'm like yeah i want to do something pr productive i feel better my mood is good but then other social interactions seem to drain me that'd be the only thing i could say is like if you're not going to do something productive then what else is there to do I, I maybe argue like enjoy the time with the people you care about because that does if you've ever had like a near-death experience or something that does become way more important in mm. like, oh, this fucking album I'm working on, I don't give two shits when I'm faced with the reality of like, I may not be able to see my kid again or something like that. So it's been yeah. a weird, it's been hard for me to wrap my, I'm just literally just rambling at this point. I'm just like using you no, as a no, sounding board. No, 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 this no, is um, just, yeah. I agree with you. I think socializing can be draining. Uh, I experience it a lot. I have, uh, this isn't unique, you've probably heard of it, a social battery, which will run low very quickly depending on the situation I'm in and I also find that as a result of the COVID pandemic that mm. you know I haven't been out much over the last two years and you know I haven't socialized much and basically the last two years um you know I spent a record amount of time on my own did a lot of soul searching so to speak I was never really good at being on my own despite being exhausted in social situations uh, I feel like I achieved a lot of personal growth. Nice. Kind of being alone uh, for so long. There was a lot of, you know, f for a long time, I couldn't be on my own for too long. But now I'm like, you know what? I 
don't mind being on my own. It's all right. I enjoy my own company. I can do the things I want to do. I can bounce off as many video games as I choose, which is normally dozens. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to find the next thing that I really resonate with. And I'm really hoping it's Elden Ring. It's got to be like, there's, there's, I played the network test. It's dope. Oh, you did? There's, How did you I like did, it? I did, yes. Uh, yeah, awesome. Really, really awesome. enjoyed it. It's, um, it's a little jarring at first how much is kind of reused from the Souls games. Like, I, f- I feel like a lot of assets were carried over, a lot of sound effects, animations, but that's fine. Uh, the world itself is beautiful. Uh, the combat is really good. Um, there's a lot more options and, and uh, new weapon animations. Like, spell castings had a big makeover. It looks there's a lot way more. cooler. It's like the first yeah, time yeah. I'm a, I might be... A, I've played a mage build on all of them, in, but never my first build, but... I'm considering breaking my rule and doing a mage build because Elden Ring, the magic looks so dope. It looks yeah, so I f- dope. I find like in uh, at least the earlier Souls games, magic always devolved into, you know, soul arrows and yes. sort of varying Basically degrees soul of soul arrows. arrows. Yeah. And a few like more powerful spells that you would save for the bosses. I find it to be quite one-dimensional, not very interesting, but it seems they've really put a lot of focus into making magic actually interesting. And so I'm considering doing some kind of spell sword build. I believe there was literally a spell sword in the network test that I had like a twin blade and no, no, it was a spear and some kind of staff and the new spells are really interesting. I thought the game was quite easy overall though, other than the main boss. I thought that was really hard, but like traversing the open world was pretty forgiving and there are like stealth mechanics now. But I, I really enjoyed my time with it. I'm sure it's not going to disappoint. I was originally concerned uh, because it's an open world. And not only do I suffer with like open world fatigue, because yep. there are just so many games with these expansive open worlds that it almost feels daunting nowadays. From Software have always made games where the level design is like just so tight and so awesome. And I was like, how is that going to translate into an open world? But from what I've played, uh, they've done a very, very good job. And you still get those kind of Souls-esque level sections between like zones, I believe. I can't remember what they're called, like legacy dungeons, legacy I believe. Legacy dungeons, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you still get that kind of level of level design uh, on top of an, an open world. Um, it Basically, it just feels like Dark Souls in an open world, which is fine. I don't know what a lot of people were expecting. I think it's going to be really good. Um, I think I'll enjoy it more than Sekiro, which uh, didn't do a lot for me. It's really, like, combat system, amazing, but on the whole, didn't have the staying power of a Souls game. I think it's because it's not an RPG. Mm -hmm. There was a little reason to keep playing it after I'd finished it. Are you not fond of, like, the uh, samurai ninja aesthetic as well? Or are you neutral on that? I liked that. I I liked it. Um, It was cool. The combat is amazing, yeah. don't get me wrong, but uh, it's very much a game that has to be played the way it intends you to play it. Yes. you got to get those parries down. It's like almost a rhythm game. It's basically a rhythm game. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's fucking great. It's their best yeah. combat system. But what I've always enjoyed about Dark Souls is build variety, building your character. I love the uh, RPG elements. I love planning a character, being like, this is the weapon I'm going to use. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to go for this spell. I'm going to go here first so I can grab this. And uh, yeah. I like the character building aspect of the Souls games. So although Sekiro, like combat, is the best they've ever done, it just doesn't have the lasting power of uh, the Souls games for me because it's, yeah, it's kind of a one-trick pony. Like it's got that combat system and you master it and it's great. But after that, it's effectively the same I mean, there are weapon arts and stuff, but they, they don't really change up the flow of the game yeah. enough. But um, I, I love it. It's a great game. It's better than most games I've played still. It just um, it didn't like s- scratch that itch that, you know, Bloodborne left me with. I need like another RPG in a From Software world, which is what Elden Ring looks to be. So here's hoping it doesn't disappoint, you know. You said early when you were a kid, you had a PS1 and 64 and you said you're 30. Hmm. So you're definitely... Um younger than me um which one was first the ps1 or the 64 oh i don't remember my first console was actually a well we call it a mega drive over here so a genesis my earliest gaming memory i guess would be sonic the hedgehog 
Um, although it's interesting because as an adult, I don't like Sonic. I don't even like the classic Sonic, so I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I'm not a. I love Sonic too, but I've tried to go back and play them either for video content or um, what have you, and they're just they're not they're rough. <laughs> they're rough. He's like really floaty. The controls are weird. I get some nostalgia from the visuals and the sounds, mm. which is enjoyable. But the actual, I've, I've tried quite a few Sonic games and more modern Sonic games. I don't find that surprising because Mega Drive kicked ass over in the UK. It outsold. Uh, Super Nintendo by, I don't know, mm. some long, long shot. So there's a lot of uh, other guests that have come from the UK that are that are pretty big Sega fans. But it sounds like you had it, but for whatever reason, the, the Sega branding, Sonic, didn't stick. No, um, I, I don't really know why. I, I guess, I don't know, I'm trying to think what I used to play as a kid. So I, I had a Genesis and I also used to play MS-DOS games on my dad's mm. computer way back when i was quite into point and clicks but i was a dumb kid so <laughs> i never got anywhere with them i had to get my parents to help me but i always enjoyed just like interacting with those worlds i guess when i started to like come into my own as a gamer was around ps1 n64 uh which did i prefer i would i guess i would say the n64 did more for me i loved them both but like thinking of like some of my favorite games it would be ocarina of time uh banjo kazooie not Banjo Tooie because I don't like the sequel. <laughs> it's annoying. Mm. What else? Mario sixty four. You know, Rareware's relationship with Nintendo back on the N sixty four. There was a time where Rareware were just on top of the world, and they were releasing banger after banger. Conquer's Bad Fur Day, Golden Eye, Perfect Dark, and those are like some of my favorite games, or at least games that I have such a fond memory of. So I remember that being like uh, the peak of gaming in my childhood. I also got a PS2 on launch, which was great. I had them all, man. Like, like I said, like I was a very lucky child to have all this wonderful stuff. I got a GameCube on launch. I did eventually get an Xbox after a while, which uh, I ended up really liking the Xbox, even the giant controller for whatever reason. I kind of liked that. Um, I think because it was genuinely a, like a very powerful bit of kit and like you could play multi-platform games on there and you could tell like the Xbox was like, was superior, you know, some, yeah, 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 some good shit. And I guess after that is when I bounced off of gaming for a while. Uh, I had a 360, but I didn't really play it. I guess most of my nostalgia is for like the N64 and also GameCube to a degree. I loved. Uh, do you remember Time Splitters? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely loved Time Splitters two and three. Like one of my favorite shooters of all time. There is something coming, right? Some kind of resurgence or remaster oh yeah a full 4k remaster of time splitters 2 was hidden inside home front the revolution i do remember unfortunately you have to play home front the <laughs> revolution to get to it and i i don't think it's tucked away at the start i think you have to get like yeah well in there <laughs> i have a series that i've been working on doing some tiktok videos like i have i haven't come up with the right uh catchphrase that's why i've been building the backlog but the term I have right now is a DIY remaster. I've been playing Time Splitters 2 on a PS2 emulator at 4K60 for like a year and a half. Mm. And then specifically GameCube 64, a lot of those emulators have what they call texture swapping capabilities. Um, I yep. did a video just recently, Mario Kart 64, but the, the community has like redone all the textures from the ground up using models. And then, or upscaled them using AI neural networks, and then they can they make these packs, and then you swap it out. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can. Um, so if you don't want to play through Homefront and you want to play Time Splitters 2 4K, mm. GameCube emulator Dolphin is awesome, or the PS2 emulator PCXS2 can do both. Sick, whatever, yeah, whatever I, I have dabbled with Dolphin, played uh, Luigi's Mansion. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I love that game. It was the only GameCube game I had for a while, and I really enjoyed it, yeah. For me, I've been having a lot of fun. I don't. When you said you feel guilty about sometimes playing a game instead of working on the two albums. The way I've got around that is by creating gaming content. So now I have, mm. a, pur I have a purpose, right? And really the purpose was the podcast was like, well, I'll build something with gaming and maybe I can leverage it for music or something because I've, I've done nothing but music as my main creative hobby from like 14 all the way up until covid when I started doing the video game stuff. Do you have like another TikTok or anything for your music no. stuff? Or? No. I played in a bunch of bands and then 
uh, the final band I played in was like a Enter Shikari kind of like screamo hardcore like 2008 era. That was the last band I played in. We did some decent amount of touring. We did okay. And then I started making music on my own as a producer. And then I started a record label. Did all that for like, I don't know, seven or eight years. And then I fell off completely um, because I needed to make money. And I was like, okay, I made okay money with the music. I supported myself full time with the wife for for the, the, the last like two or three years. But there was a moment where I was like, I was packing down after a show and I was playing as a solo act which helped because I wasn't splitting money with anybody. Yeah. But even then I was thinking like <clears throat> all the time producing the cost of producing, mixing, marketing, travel, playing the show. It's like, I'm making like eight bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. if, you really, if you really think about it. And I just, I had been opening for guys who that I felt like were much farther ahead. And I was looking at their life and realized that, yeah, they were making a little bit more money, but they weren't as free as maybe I thought they were. And yeah. I, aside from, you know, when you're young and doing music, a big part is like you want to feel cool, you want attention, you want to feel validated, you want to get girls, whatever. There's some of that, and then some of it. A big part of it was me. Is I didn't. I wanted freedom. I didn't want to like work a nine to five. And I I saw that like doing music is way cooler. It's more enjoyable, and you can make money. So why would I do other stuff to make money when you can make money doing shit I already like? But then you, I sort of just felt like I don't know if I can make it. A lot of the guys who I thought had made it, their lifestyle when I go on tour with them or whatever, or open a few runs with them, it's just like, I don't know if that's what I want to do. And so I went all in um, on internet marketing. I got a job at an internet marketing agency, just did like the corporate gig to two agencies, left after like five, six years of marketing. And then I did my own agency up until, uh, up until now. And then that has come full circle. That's all on autopilot. And now I have the time to like make TikToks all day and do music. And it's like, I have everything I wanted, but just without like the fame, but I don't care about the fame anymore as much no. as I did when I was young. I just care about the lifestyle. And so for me, it's like, I can get, I can motivate myself. Like, well, I can use the TikTok as an asset, as a leverage. And maybe this is my long winded approach of like, I don't know, depending on how you want to brand your socials or how, or whatever, but you could also incorporate just because you're a music based person. It doesn't mean that if you did a video of you playing dark souls or the riff of one of your riffs or a clip of you having like, it wouldn't offend me. I wouldn't unfollow you. It wouldn't be like, no, I think you can still extract value out of that. If, if you had the mind for it is what a long winded way of what I'm trying to say. I think, at least on TikTok, consistency is very, very important. Yeah. So I, I stick to the same hashtags, the same sort of content. And as much as I am a gamer, like I have a YouTube channel, I did Let's Plays for the last two years. Um, I never really got anywhere with it. And I feel like, um, I guess with you as well, with the gaming memories, TikTok, like your posts do really well because you've really kind of, you know, you've got your audience there and you're giving them the content they want. And I guess, uh, you know, for example, if you attempted to, post something musical on there uh you are risk upsetting the algorithm don't you and that's the problem if you fall out of favor with an algorithm it's very hard to get back on your feet again but um regarding like touring that is something that i did for a time as well i was in a band called malefice for like five years that was never going to be full time because we weren't a very big band but that lifestyle I can agree is exhausting and also like to make it in music is such a grind such a and grind. also there's yeah. a lot of stuff that just isn't very desirable like I mean if you're lucky you'll get hotels and stuff but even still like you say you won't really make much money like we we weren't a big band but we did a few headline tours and I remember coming back home from tour and I would have like a hundred pounds which was nice but I would have spent more than that on booze even though we had a rider and stuff. So it wasn't anything more than a hobby, really. But um, I kind of, the reason I do studio projects now is because I don't think that lifestyle is for me. I do miss being on stage, but um, I can't imagine being a full-time musician. Oof. It just seems exhausting, like being away from home. And I, I get irritated around other people. It's nothing to do with them. But if I don't get personal space, you yeah. don't really get that on tour, do you? Nope. So <laughs> if, if you don't get any alone time... At least for me, I find myself getting very, very irritable 
that I just I I have no time to like be by myself and just unwind. I'm constantly yeah. with people and they're great people. Like my bandmates were great, but I just ended up getting I guess frustrated because I was like I just want to be alone for a moment and I can't. I'm in some shitty venue uh, in the south of England and yeah. I'm surrounded by people that I love, but my God, they're annoying me because yeah. <laughs> uh, I've spoken to them all day, every day for the last two weeks, you know, so that, that was tough. And that's kind of why I've leaned into studio projects now because I get to write music, which is where my real passion is. Like writing uh, is, is the real passion. Well, I do miss playing live to a degree, but I also have bad memories playing live. Like had some really bad shows. Mm. I don't know if you ever experienced oh, like, yeah, horrific shows where the turnouts are terrible or the sound uh, yes. is bad and you know I, th there's a lot of stuff that just makes it seem nostalgia blinds me quite often i'm like oh we did some cool shit and you know we had those shows where everyone was going nuts and felt like a rock star for a moment but then there were other shows where there were six or seven people there and i was like why the fuck am i all the way up you know in the north of england to play to seven or eight people I can't be bothered or like, is this worth it? I was always debating whether I really wanted to do it anymore. And uh, that band came to an end in 2015, which is when I started doing video game covers. And then three years later, packed that in. And then I did the Mentis Ritual, which will only be a studio band. Well, I can't see it ever being anything more than a studio project. It's really unlikely because, you know, I've just given you a list of reasons why touring is <laughs> like not great, but... I'd say everything outside of playing the show can be bullshit and exhausting and not very fun. And that is a big part of being in a band. Like the actual performing aspect of playing in a band is actually very minimal compared to yeah. traveling, sleeping on sofas, being surrounded by your bandmates. It's, uh, it's draining. It wasn't really for me, which is why I've leaned into studio stuff and I can kind of I guess uh, I had to learn how to record stuff on my own to make that step. And now that I can, like, it's uh, really great, I would say. It's opened up a lot of avenues for me, being able to record. What's your typical riff writing process like? Like when you sit down and you want to start doing riffs, do you have a, a system you follow? Oh, uh, I'll just mess around. I'll play like, I don't know, I'll get my tone set up on the computer and then I'll just start kind of messing around and, you know, I'll find the sort of shapes that I use and the scales and I'll go from there. And then I, I, I might find something that I'm playing, like a sequence of notes or a lick or an idea, like a groove, like just a basic rhythm that's really in my head, like dun, 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 dun. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a cool rhythm. Where could that go? Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I might need, it needs like a lick or a harmonic or something, and then I'll just mess around. I think, I, I don't know if this is a technical term, I've heard this somewhere, I think it's called riff building. It's like assembling a riff like Lego. Like you start with a basic idea, and you kind of go from there. I also do this thing as well, I learned this was a term. Uh, I think it's called ABCD riff structure. A, a lot of riffs, like you have the first bit, and then the second bit, and the third bit, and the fourth bit, so like maybe a bar of each. Or it's like, how can I repeat the same kind of riff, but keep it interesting? And you'll notice in a lot of my riffs, I'm kind of looping the same idea, but with some variation. Like I'll do a chuggy bit and then I'll come back to that chuggy bit, but the, the rhythm has changed. And now there's a few more notes. It, it very much is like building or Lego to a degree. Uh, there's no like science behind it. It's just something I've leaned into. And uh, I mostly write in 4-4. Four, four. I just... I mess around until I come up with like a lick or something that's cool. And then I'll try and build a riff on top of that. And sometimes the riffs just fall out of me. And I've written some riffs where I'm just like, I don't know how I did that, but it's cool. But I've been playing for 19 years. I guess like I'm, I'm a, I would say I'm a fairly competent writer. I know what I'm trying to do now. It doesn't come easy. It's just, you know, I can't always just pick up my guitar and make a TikTok video which is why I don't post very often because I now feel like I have to uh, continuously up the quality of what I'm doing and it's difficult. I don't just want to release anything. It's a, it's a difficult process, I would say, but it's really rewarding, especially when I listen back to stuff and 
you know, most of what I post as well is new material that will be mixed and mastered and sound a lot better than what it sounds like on TikTok. And that's really exciting that a lot of people are, you know, um, digging it as much as they are. Really, really awesome. Uh, there's no like tried and tested way to write. I think any songwriter will just kind of fall into whatever works with them. I program all the drums in Guitar Pro, drop it into my DAW, and then I just mess around. And, you know, like, especially making content for TikTok, it's not too ridiculous to come up with a riff and film a video. It's not too much work. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do that. And especially if that's the intention is I'm going to try and write a sick riff and post it. And those videos do well. I, like, I don't know about you, but shorter videos do really well for me, I find. What a time, like, is there a second range that you're targeting that you've come up with based on your experience? I guess like 15, sec 15 to 20 seconds in that area. I've been coming to the uh, 17 seconds is kind of where I target. So we're, mm. we're, in, the, we're in the head, same headspace for sure. I like to post stuff for people to duet, but those videos don't do well anymore because I'm posting a minute long video and mm. nobody watches it. You did one that I was jamming to. Um, I don't know if it was like the time signature was off, but it seemed like the video didn't loop quite. So it was like really hard to practice to because I would like start to, it was a shorter riff. It was not a minute long. Um, this, that rings a bell. Anyway, I'm going to, I was actually planning on ripping it off my phone and making a perfect loop and sending it back to my phone. But then I got distracted, like with everything. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> no, it happens. Yeah, I get that. Um, but it wasn't that long. The one that, the one I was thinking of wasn't that long. Maybe my memory's wrong. I think I need to uh, just approach how I do duets differently now. I think I've normally done like, oh, I'll do like up to 59 seconds because that's uh, the most you can do. But yeah. People don't want to write 59 seconds worth of music. They also won't listen to it. So those do really poorly, at least for me. It's the, it's the shorter, self-contained, one riff videos that do well for me. So I'm just going to stick with more of those. Is there a process you follow to put all of those? So let's say you're making these TikTok videos, you come up with a bunch of sick riffs. Is there a process that you follow to putting them together in a full song? Or is it kind of like you just, these ones seem to work together. I start putting them together. How does that work? Uh, so I, I must have had, I must have dozens of demos that are just one or two riffs because of TikToks. But a lot of stuff I post is like, I would say an edited version of a bigger song. Okay. Although recently I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to write new every time rather than dig through demos of stuff that isn't out yet. Cause I don't want to give away too much of that. But I think I'm still trying to figure out what works for me, really. I'm still relatively new to TikTok. You know, some posts do well, some posts don't. It's just figuring out what works. The rate my riff stuff works. I did the whole Fred Durst thing. That was that seemed to do all right, although that stopped now because I actually have been in contact with Fred Durst, so I can't do it anymore. <laughs> it worked! <laughs> it, it did worked. work, yes. Um, I, I don't know whether it will go anywhere, but he spoke to me on Instagram about a collaboration uh, which is mad. That was really, really awesome. But I want to keep Dude, it low-key. The low new Big Biscuit album is pretty good. Mm. Dad Vibes, I think song that song, Dad Vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fucking still awesome. Sucks. Yeah, no, they've still got it, man. And uh, I'm, I was a big Limp Biscuit fan back when I was like 11. Uh, one of the reasons I'm into metal now, I started with new metal and then got into like heavier stuff over yeah. time. Whether we will actually collaborate, I don't know, but I've spoken to him in the DMs and he's cool and i would love to so hopefully the door is still open but i'm trying not to be a fanboy and i don't want to be assertive or pushy i kind of just want to see what happens but i'm not yeah. banking on it because he's like he's mad famous dude like fucking it's fred durst bro he's ridiculous he's he's pretty famous he's well known i mean um even the people who aren't into any of that stuff if you just showed a picture of him with especially with the red cap on they're gonna know who that is I'm like oh yeah that's the nookie guy Exactly. And yeah. like ju just the fact that he has listened to some of my stuff and, you know, engaged with it and he really likes it and he still consistently comments on stuff that I post. That's really awesome. Yeah, it's man. mad. You should do more duets with other people. Switch from I Fred Durst to, uh, I don't mean, what's their name? They do the, this is my last resort. It's like that Papa one. Roach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Papa Roach. They interact with a bunch of people on TikTok. I've mm. seen like a bunch of videos. 
they had like some guy that did a, like an official remix with because he did like a bootleg remix. His name's Jerome yeah. or something. I can't remember his name. They ended up doing like a full song release with them, and it all happened because of TikTok. So if you could have any singer in the world, any vocalist in the world for an album, a magic wand, who would it be? Fucking hell, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I've never really thought about that. Shit. Well, my first choice wouldn't be Fred Durst. To be honest with you, that's, that was a joke to begin with. But I obviously rate Fred and love Limp Bizkit. Um, as for who would I pick? I, oh, this is probably a stock answer. James Hetfield, that would be cool. Great singer. Obviously, I write stuff that's just very far removed from Metallica. But I don't know. I started on Thrash. I could write some Thrash. My new band was originally a Thrash band, and then we deleted all of our material and started over so yeah that would be cool or i guess like more contemporary metal vocals phil bozeman from Whitechapel. if you're familiar with them i think he's fucking amazing one of the sickest in the game otherwise i don't know like i i really rate uh the mentors ritual singer and he's only gotten better since lordship this is an area that i'm not familiar with because i've never produced vocals especially screaming vocals how much of that is real and how much of that is studio magic? Because sometimes I'm just like, how can someone like guttural that low for that long? And then, and then the next phrase, is it like, can, can he go th- and can he go through the whole song with, or is it like you lose so much breath during this section in reality, you got to record it. And, and we, I've always wondered, cause it just, when you hear it, it's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> How? I guess you would say studio magic in a sense that not, it's not tracked in one sitting and typically yeah. he'll, he'll do it not line by line, but like he'll do a bit and then another bit and, you know, he'll punch in, he'll like join one take and then do another. I think, you know, everyone kind of does it. Maybe, well, maybe not everyone, but it's quite common because you, you are, you want the best performance, right? But again, it's not really a concern with a studio band, yeah. Whether he could do it in one sitting, I don't doubt that he could. He could, but it's not really something we have to consider. And likewise, for me, like I've written guitar riffs that are really hard and I wouldn't want to play them live because they're really hard. <laughs> so <laughs> they're not unplayable. They're just uncomfortably yeah. difficult. There's a bit of guitar on Lordship that I would describe as the peak of my ability. Uh, it's like a sweep section with some string skipping in the song called Abyssal Entombment and uh, it's really 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 hard and it's kind of a relief that I don't have to play that live but I mean you know I edit my guitars but I don't do anything that isn't genuine I can play everything just you know we're striving for the best possible product so there is studio magic there but uh, you know we're not dishonest about it and frankly every band is you know editing Oh yeah, I have, sound as good I have as no qualms with that. I mean, that's standard procedure. I guess what I was asking is like, like how does it sound so brutal? Like, his, does his voice sound so brutal? Like, if I was sitting in the room next to him, I would say so. Yeah, um, but on top of that, it's like compression, gain reduction, EQ, all, all the. Tr- okay. I'm not much of a producer myself. Like, I, I do demos. I know how to record like i know how to engineer so to speak but I, i'm not much of a mixer okay um, it's not really within my skill set but you know i've heard him in person he can do that and he he likes to contort his body to achieve those sort of sounds like he's twisting his you know neck and his throat and stuff it sounds epic as shit yeah and he's he's gotten a lot better like on lordship i mean it's still true of this release to be fair his voice sits mostly in like i would say the low to low mid range there are no highs on lordship because he just doesn't fuck with highs which is fair enough that's his decision um but he's kind of opened up more uh he's a lot better um enunciating and adding like various inflections to his vocals which is an, a very cool element of the new stuff and also uh, a friend of his that may or may not be joining the project we'll see, is doing some high vocals, some like black metal highs, uh, which is a nice additional layer to the new stuff. Very much his idea. Matt was like, what do you think if my bud does some high vocals? And I was like, sure. And that's just added another like dynamic to to the overall sound. But like I say, we have a single out soon when it's done. I wish I could be more specific about every project I'm in, but it's all a matter of as and when. 
You know, is, is there a name for the other one that you were referencing earlier? No, um, I like Soul of the Lost, which is oh, from yes, Demon you did Souls. That. Yeah, yeah. But um, the bass player and drummer are not keen on it, and I keep saying, suggest something else. Then they're very quick to uh, shoot me down, but not suggest anything, which is fine. It's just irritating. Perhaps we just haven't found the right name yet. I'll keep an open mind. I'm not like dead set on anything really. I'm quite reasonable to work with like what whatever name we settle on. Is it too much to have a project named after Bloodborne and one named after Demon Souls though? Is no. that overkill? Never. No. Never. <laughs> I feel like I, I never told them that it was from Demon Souls either. Because I feel like should that have. Yeah. Just yeah, I feel be. like they would shut me down. I'd be like, oh, but we're not like a, a nerdy band. We're not writing about demons. So it's, it's just Soul of the Lost. It's cool. I, what did the bass player say? Oh, wouldn't we have to be Souls of the Lost? I was like, why would we have to be? We're not the Souls of the Lost. That's not what the name is. I'm not saying we are these things. <laughs> like, it's just a name. Like, any name. Uh, it is what it is. The joy of coming up with a name. It is important to have one that everyone likes. I, uh... My producer name because I hate coming up with names and I had struggled with bands that I had played with in the past. I just uh like I came up with one, I was like, fuck it, I'm just gonna use it, and I never thought about it again because I just wanted to move on and get on to the other shit. And I do regret that because I didn't like it pretty early on, but it was mm. like I'm stuck with it and I had already put and I already had some releases. It was just like ah. So I would say that it's worth going through that song and dance until you find something that everybody's happy with. It's annoying as shit, though. It is, yeah, but ultimately we still don't have a vocalist, so there is no... It's not like we're waiting on a name. We have as much time as it takes to find the right singer. So in the meantime, I'm happy to just, you know, occasionally I'll come up with a name and we'll discuss it, and if it's not right, it's not right. But uh, it'll be a different story if I'm like, you know, if we have a mixed and mastered record ready to go and we're just waiting on a name. Yeah. At that point, I will be like, pick something we need something but again it's not something you want to necessarily rush into is it because that name needs to be uh i guess marketable memorable i like the mentis ritual it's it's a cool I name i love it dude it's so dope mm. even if you don't know that it's that's a bloodborne reference it sounds cool the mentis ritual it sounds mysterious um mensis like i didn't playing bloodborne it, you think I would be smart enough to figure this out quicker because the whole theme of blood, but I didn't connect Mensis and Menstrual like no. for like halfway through the game until I started reading, you know, instead of getting to understand the basically watching YouTube videos of lore. And I was like, oh, oh, ah, I see. Yeah, I won't go into specifics, <laughs> but uh, Mensis, spelled with an E, is an actual word and is rather disgusting so i won't talk about it but um i didn't really realize that i didn't put that together it's like the school of mensis i was like that's just the name yeah of the the school of mensis but it makes sense yeah it's very much you know leaning into menstruation yes but it is spelled differently the spell with the eye looks cooler too definitely yeah it looks cooler i had a comment once it was like all right mr period blood or something (laughs) I was like, what the fuck? And I'd say, yeah, okay, whatever. I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't didn't pay any attention to it. I had a friend that was literally in a like noise core band called Period Blood. You know, I, I don't know how like politically correct or uh, censored you want to be here, you know, so I'm I've happy to say Period, period blood. blood being, is that, oh, I guess you guys have a different relationship to the word blood in the UK than we do. Maybe that's why. That's, <laughs> that's why you, you can call someone blood if they're your, like, homeboy. You can't say Not bloody, right? Isn't that a thing? No, we, I, it was bloody hell all the time. But isn't bloody yeah. considered a uh, swear word? Swear word. Uh, or is it, I like, was, not, is that old school back when I was a that's kid? That's old school. I was told okay. I was told as much when I was a child, but <laughs> it's, it's stupid. It's not a swear word. It's, just, it's bloody is... You know, it's it's good for giving some emphasis to a word. Like, that was a bloody joke. You know, that was yeah. bloody unbelievable, you know. I would. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm considered quite posh over here. You so, don't not actually, that I am. you don't curse that much. Mm, I've been, I guess I've been trying to rein it in because oh, okay. I'm on your podcast and I, I believe we didn't really speak about, you know, I wouldn't just want to start swearing and you're like, 
yo, uh, that's not acceptable. And now my editor's going to have to scrub through all the audio and censor everything. I, I think swearing on the whole, like, use it sparingly. And it, it is better to use sparingly because it, yeah. it has more power if you don't overuse it. It holds more meaning. Yeah. I uh, saying that when I did Let's Plays, like, I was <laughs> playing very hard games. I tend to swear a lot more in those just oh, because. Yes. Dark Souls will bring it out of you. There's this amazing uh, Reddit like comment thread that went around. It was making the, the rounds probably like a week ago of a wife who just wrote down everything her husband said during 20 minutes of video games. And it was just <laughs> a constant string of profanity. Jesus. I'm like, yeah, I, just, I can get, sometimes I'll get embarrassed. I'm like, glad I'm not recording because if I'm getting really pissed off. Speaking of God of War, there's this like uh, side boss, like the h actual hardest boss in the game, but it's not, you don't have to fight her. I, I rage smashed the couch. Like I like hammer fisted the couch after calling her everything under the sun. <laughs> I had a, an excess controller on the couch. And this was like two days after Christmas. I had just bought a brand new TV playing God of War on my new TV. And I smashed the couch and the, the controller bounces off the couch, flies into the screen and shatters the screen. Oh my god! Ah, That's it was horrific. like I just sat there, like w blinking, waiting for it to be like a dream. Like this can't, this can't just have happened. This can't have just happened. Mm, and it a did. lesson learned. A lesson yeah. learned. I try to. I was almost. I felt like the gods were like teaching me a lesson. Like you got to rein yeah. your shit in, bro. Man, I've been there. I've I've nearly smashed controllers before. I had to give up playing. Uh, I used to play Call of Duty online, like around about the time of Black Ops or. Yeah, Black Ops 1 and 2, and uh, it, it used to make me so mad that I would just <laughs> never have fun. And eventually I was like, I, why am I doing this? This isn't fun. Like, I couldn't stop myself getting invested and salty, so I just stopped playing after a while. I don't, I don't, really, I don't really engage with multiplayer games at all nowadays. I like a good single-player experience, you know, just something I can sink into. And despite being a big fan of the Dark Souls games, like I don't get much of a temper playing games at all, really. It's all part of the fun, you know? I don't really like change, but I feel like I have to explore new avenues sometimes and just take risks on things. Like, I was shitting it about this podcast. I don't know why, but I'm really? here. And Did, I mean, the TikTok's done better and I am getting more listeners, but we're talking like, like maybe a thousand people will listen to this. Maybe. 750 to 1,000 is, like, pretty solid. That's terrifying to me. Really? I don't, that's, I don't dude, know. That's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I, I do kind of keep myself to myself online. You'll notice that most of my videos, I am a headless You don't show body. your face. You don't show yeah. your face. I noticed that, yeah. Mm, I, I used to. I just, I don't know. I'm not very You're a good-looking chap. I don't know what you're worried about. It's only because it's so bright in here, you can't see my skin. <laughs> you got thank a very... You. Thick, full beard. A lot of men can't grow beards. Freshly trimmed. Yeah, it's going Not for, for the you. podcast, for the for the job tomorrow. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'll take it, though. I'll take it. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know what it is. I guess it's me on some kind of Instagram. Dude, I was level. fanboying about you. I'm like, dude, I called my brother. I found this band that's named after Bloodborne, Mentis Ritual, and they're fucking heavy. And he's going to come on the podcast. He's like, sweet. That's that's sick. That's all you got to think about. It's, yeah, Do you know I what um, imposter syndrome is? Have you ever heard of that? Oh yeah, deal with it all the time. Yeah. So I mean, I'm yeah, I'm same. joking, but I I'm I get where you're coming. Sometimes I wonder, I'm like, am I just a dumbass who got lucky? Mm. Or and here's the thing: I think imposter syndrome comes from because if you have a, a high enough awareness, you understand that luck is part of everybody's life. Like there's a lot of things that are out of your control. And so you can never get away from that. Yes, I was very lucky, but there's a lot of people who are just as lucky as me and not in the same position. Both are true at the same mm. time. Yeah, you're and absolutely right. And I think you can, get, you can like imposter syndrome, you can get sucked into this focusing on everything that like had nothing to do with you, which I think is good to be aware because it helps you from being judgmental, helps you to be more empathetic and understand that in another life, I'm that guy. Just some of those decisions went wrong or some bad breaks that I didn't have, whatever. 
I think it's good to be aware of that, but you have to also give yourself credit. I mean, you you are really good at the guitar. Look, I'm, even though I'm not a guitar player, I've been playing in bands. I've been listening to lots of riffs and metal for a long time. You write dope shit. And when you said I've been playing for 19 years, it shows. All right? It just happens to be a skill that's really hard to make money with. You just got fucking <laughs> yeah. good at something that's like just a bad market. You know what mm. I mean? I, say, I, I think I just struggled to find my platform. But now TikTok's going well. TikTok's so, going to, I would say, keep it up. You know, imposter syndrome and anxiety in general, I will always kind of experience that to a degree, but I think I'm beginning to get more of a handle on it. So I can post more and I want to show my face on TikTok more. I do. I don't really know why I don't. I feel like people are just fucking horrible on there, but I'm an adult. Well, like, they why are, do I care? Yeah. You know? They are, but uh, you also, uh, for the argument for not showing your face, I do kind of like that it's like, this is about the riff, right? That this content's about the riff. You're like, who cares? I mean, I guess it, it is about like playing the riff because that's the skill. So seeing your hands is relevant. It's, it's not just the audio that's important, but seeing it actually played is important. But you can make the argument that, that you know, other than just being someone who enjoys your content, it was like, you know, curious to see your face, but... But I mean, I know, know what you're saying about you like that it's about the riff and I do too. And I frame it. So you just, you see the, the two hands, the frets, the chugs, and it's all about the riff. But uh, the people that are doing well on TikTok that are also guitar players, like they show a lot of themselves. They put a lot of their personality out there. And that is something that I would like to do. Yeah, I might do it on a... I don't know. A lot of people have been asking me for a tone breakdown video and I wasn't sure how to approach it. So I was thinking of editing something together involving a whole bunch of screen recording and then like footage of me talking and then footage of me playing something on that level. I don't know. I do, I do feel like I need to put more of myself into what I'm doing in order to uh, grow more, but we'll see, I guess. I think so. I mean, if the people are asking for it, you yeah. already know there's a certain market for it. I've done a few videos based on comments or somebody asking and they've all done uh, well. And I think it's also, I've noticed by genuinely interacting, like people will ask like, how do you do this or this? I mean, I don't want to make a full video like, ah, especially because tutorial videos sometimes are a lot of work to edit it mm. all down. And, and yep. it's just like, like, how do I do this mod or how do I do that? I will go out of my way to think of like, how can I give them the most useful information in the limited characters of a TikTok comment. Or I'll go out of my way to make like pin something like this is the link where you find the emulator. This is the link where blah, blah, blah. What I know people are going to be asking and just try to be useful. Um, I've noticed that those people will, they're very thankful. They follow and then they start interacting with a ton of videos. Just because I think what you were saying, it's like, I guess the positive comments are normal, but usually when someone's interacting, this is my just kind of armchair theory. Usually when you're interacting with someone in the comment section, you're usually trying to slam dunk and piss on each other because of some political issue or whatever thing, video that mm. triggered you and they're triggered. People are, they, you joined the dumpster fire, right? And then I, I think it's refreshing when s someone, they might say something that's like semi-negative, whatever in the comment section. And if I can come back and give them something useful, they end up, I've had it multiple times where I'll see that person follow me immediately after I chose to interact that way. And then they end up, I'll see them interact on video. So I think it's like, but then I also, some days I can't resist the temptation to just be like a little shit bag back. And, uh, it's hard, man. Some Kill days I'm petty. Kindness. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't really engage, but if someone says something very, very stupid, I try to make a joke of it. It's the best way. Again, I don't think it looks good as a creator to be engaging with haters no it looks terrible every time i do it yeah. i i regret it and i'm like but then it looks worse to delete it when people know because then you're like even more i'm like fine i'll let it stand it was a mistake but i'm i can't do that again obviously i expect you get a lot more comments than i do um i can't possibly reply to all of them i find it quite overwhelming i also get anxious just scrolling through there because sometimes i don't like what i read so sometimes i just have to step away from it altogether you know, the negative comments, unless I can make a joke at their expense or just kind of have a discussion, if they're saying something very stupid, I normally just point out that that didn't make any sense or what are you referring to? Yeah. I think on 
But ultimately, it's not really worth responding. Like the people that matter are the ones that are saying the nice stuff. So yeah. But sure. I mean, how many times can you respond to someone saying, "This is fucking sick"? Like I struggle. I I'm obviously very grateful that everyone's yeah, so can. nice. Yeah. But I can't, so I just like most of it and occasionally will respond to someone. Have you had back-to-back bangers before? I Like once, because usually not. But I, I, mm. I had a string not too long ago where it was like maybe like one or two in between, but I had like a chunk of like six or seven bangers in the course of like a month, which is very weird. It's so it's so weird. I feel like there's so much we don't understand about that algorithm. Uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and so much. In fact, I tested the. Uh, have you ever played a game called Dante's Inferno? It's like God of War, old school. But yeah, long, play- long, long time ago, I had it on PS3. Yeah, pretty, pretty dope hack and slash. Pretty dope hack hell. and slash, and some metal as fuck uh, aesthetics. And there's a part where <laughs> the the lust boss has n- mouths for nipples, and they birth demon babies out of her nipples, and then you have to fight these demon babies with like blades. It's badass. I knew. I'm like, this is like sketchy because it's, it's like, it's a video game, but it's like tits. And I was like, huh, I wonder mm. if I'm going to get in trouble, but it's like such a cool part of the game. And I had a previous Dante's Inferno video that did well about flaming buttholes because there's literally flaming buttholes. I, th- so, I think I saw that one actually, yeah. So I'm like, jokes. I got to do another Dante's Inferno, but like the butthole, like the term butthole is not going to flag an algorithm. And then the actual visual was like, I'm like it's not going to do, but I'm like, I tried to frame the camera to like make it so it didn't, I don't know, just to play the algorithm. And then I uploaded it and before it even got a play and before anything happened, I had like a warning, like within 30 seconds of like nudity. So it, ha- it obviously is scanning your shit visually before anything and running hmm. it through some sort of whatever. Um, and then I re-uploaded it and I just put like a little face over her nipple, like rotoscoped in a little face of a guy. And then it uploaded just fine. Like no so they, they have like a nipple detecting AI or they something. They have nipple detecting AI that is so good, even if it's a video game nipple that's a mouth with a spider coming out of it, it can still tell. Can it differentiate between a male and female nipple then? I suppose it can. That's a good question. This is, sounds like an experiment. that <laughs> <laughs> Put it to the test, yeah. Yeah, See what yeah. happens. I have experienced the same thing. Like The only reason I took the podcast more seriously is because the videos started popping off on TikTok. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, maybe I'll do more of this. Like, I was planning on just making beats and doing the same shit I was already doing. Your um, your TikTok videos, do, do they exist as they are? Are they not part of anything bigger or, you know, longer content on YouTube or anything? Great question. I am, I have a bank of content that's deeper content for YouTube. So, like, a lot of stuff where, like, I played through all of Final Fantasy VIII on the PC with all like the craziest mods you could find where textures had been upscaled by AI. Like, I did all the work of like putting in all these mods together. Not that I actually did it. Obviously the community who makes the mods, they're like the ground level. They're the real geniuses. Then there's nerds like me that will like put it all together. And if, and it's curious, like maybe you're not way into final fantasy eight, but it's like, I want to see what that would look like. Hmm. I played through the whole game, beat all the bosses i ran the all the footage through like an ai inter, interpolation for 60 fps so it's like if you want to see what it would look like if you could have a true 60 fps like hd remaster of final fantasy 8 here's an idea because it's mm. not real but like we can kind of with emulation in some video post-processing like get you footage that looks like hey this is what it would look like and i I'm going to upload that. That's like two hours long. It's like all the boss battles put together, edited together. Was that with commentary or is it just game? No play? commentary. Okay. It's about the game, right? Yeah. I think I will do more videos with commentary and maybe around because people ask, like, how do you set this up? Lots of videos of me playing retro games with all the cool shit I can find a way to do with emulation and then just posting it. So I have a a playlist retro in 4k where it's like okay today i'm playing this game on the sega saturn i did all these cool tweaks with the emulation this is how good i could get it looking with my setup you know and here's like five ten minutes of it so i'm trying to do more of that stuff i have it all backed up um i have a ton of games that i'm going through it it is enjoyable because it gives me like a purpose to the game like i'm playing these retro games for a purpose for content and then from that footage that bank of footage for youtube stuff that's where I make my my TikTok videos. 
You make them all externally, right, on your computer, I imagine. You're not doing anything in-app on TikTok, are you? No, everything's done, yeah. like in video Same. and Premiere. And then... Um, w- wouldn't know where to begin on TikTok as an editor. <laughs> like, no idea. No. Never, yeah, never used it. I don't have playlists yet, which kind of pisses me off. Do you have playlists yet? No, and it also pisses me off, because that would be great. But I, I feel like it depends what type of account you are. And I'm too scared to switch to... A business account? I am a business. I did it like way in the beginning just because I was like, whatever. But I don't have playlists. And I just keep thinking, it's like, I see people with less followers that have playlists. Like, what is like the criteria for getting playlists? I have no idea. I I feel like it's random. It's been rolled out to some people and not others. I thought it was to do with what type of account you were, but I believe... I don't know. I I think it asked me to convert to business, or at least that's what I thought would solve it. I read somewhere that that would allow me to do it, but I was like, I am not risking anything with my account, right? Like it's working so far. If I swap to business, it could just fuck everything up. Yeah. You know, what's the alternative to a uh, business? I'm going to have a quick look actually. I think it's just Re- personal and it's personal or business, right? So there's two. Yeah. I think you're right. I just want to double check. You're right. It's it's a binary choice then, creator and business, and doesn't work for you, doesn't work for me. So what the fuck? <laughs> What's the secret? Why are they uh, holding out on us? I don't know, but it would be nice to have the people have asked. I've, I've had people literally comment because some people like they're not necessarily interested in all retro games, but they like a certain game that I've done, mm. and they want more of that. Like one guy's like, "Can you just organize all the?" footage of game a into a playlist it's like i would love to dude i would love to but do that I for can't, you, yeah. but i can't it'd just be so useful especially for your type of content as well also it just feeds into this loop of people watching more of your stuff which uh they're not likely to do unless they go on your profile and scroll through all of your videos but if you present yeah. them with the option to click a playlist then that's just more views that you're getting overall so yeah i would I, love to have it like ps1 or like all this is all my midnight racer whatever game it is just the top most requested games but yeah such as such as the life like i have i'm going to be doing more dark speaking of my best videos almost to a million and it's uh i don't know if you've seen the dark souls mod called dark souls remast tester yeah it's uh inferno plus it's like halo guns in dark yeah, souls yeah is that yeah. Right? yeah yeah, and yeah. I, i'm dressed up as solaire cuz they have a, it comes with like a character editor you can literally just give yourself whatever items i maxed all my stats out like what would it be like if you could actually get to like level 999 it takes so many souls like i had to i had to give myself the max number of souls like a hundred times because the last because it's like exponential as you start getting higher levels it's more souls and you get less rewards Mm. so for a while it's like every every 10 levels you get like maybe one point of something right it's the scaling just cuts down but i got my guy all the way to like straight nines and then i dressed him up as solaire and what i like about that is you have to find the guns you can't actually spawn the guns into your inventory the way that at least i couldn't you have to actually play the game and if they're hidden they're fucking hard to find too are they are they infinite ammo is that right uh they, no you but see- you just i just edit myself ammo in with the editor uh, okay yeah yeah because uh, um, yeah. i'm just playing now i'm playing through just to break and fuck with the game so i'm playing as solaire and i'm just killing everyone with the npcs <laughs> like i'm just murdering i was like what happens if you just murder everybody but go through the game all npcs all everything like i don't know what's gonna happen but, and then you there's a spell you can like fly, which breaks all sorts of shit. Oh, I saw that you shit. went to uh, yeah. Anor Londo. I tried and to, then yeah. Fell to your death. Is it because it wouldn't load in? Did you yeah, respawn no, there though? No, I respawned back where uh, at, the, at the. Well, I never died. I actually had to quit the game because I just fell through the geometry and just fell uh, forever. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, there's just no collision detection, so it's like it's loading in these really low level models the background but it's actually not loading any of the real the playable geometry yeah it it doesn't it doesn't trigger loading because it only has these load triggers for certain points of the game where you actually can go through so you just yeah kind of go off into nothing you're not supposed to see it up close are you it's just supposed to be like and that's one thing dark souls does really well right it shows distant areas like you can always see other areas from other you know wherever you are and that's very cool and the cool thing about the dark souls one level it actually all does connect have you seen those maps where people take all the areas and put them together. It really does all work in 3D mm. space. Whereas Dark Souls 2 is like, remember the spot where uh, you, you're like climbing down a mountain, whatever, and you go into like the, the castle fire area with the lava? 
You go up an elevator, you're at, you go, you're at the top of a windmill, and you go into a yeah. volcano. Yeah. How am I, I so, don't mean, like, how the fuck does this work? Like, so, I'm a Dark Souls 2 defender, but I will admit that it's, it's a botched job in terms of the way the world is connected. I'm pretty sure it, I think someone in a map editor even went through it, and it, it overlaps in a way that wouldn't make any sense. But there are a number of people that will tell you that it's not supposed to make sense because you're going hollow and, you know, it's part of the process. Um, but in reality, it's because uh, the game, like, switched gears halfway through development and they had to scrap everything. So what we got was cobbled that. together. Yeah, it had a very difficult development cycle and they had to restart with a new director, I believe. It was supposed to have a time travel mechanic and everything. Oh, if, if, yeah, really? it, it was it was going to be a very different game. I don't know how much cut content there is out there on it, but basically uh, the reason the world is a joke and like stitched together is because it was cobbled together because they had these levels that were designed uh, earlier on and then they were like, right, well, we need to, we need Dark Souls 2, so we'll just connect that windmill to this volcano. And it doesn't, <laughs> make, it doesn't make any sense. No, yeah. So, you know, apologists will try and claim that it's part of the law. And, like, they they will say that your character just doesn't remember how they got between these areas. Like, they're in some kind of dreamland. However, it's because the game was cobbled together with a bunch of stuff that was probably Makes supposed to be sense. entirely different. Yeah, and it's, uh, by the sounds of things, we're lucky we even got it at all. And it probably would have been cancelled Maybe, but I really like Dark Souls too. I can see why people hate it. But I, I had the most really hours game. in it, ironically, and most playtime on Steam in Dark Souls Two. Mm. That's not even including Scar of the First Sin. I have to combine those two together. Dark Souls Three. Uh, I put Dark Souls One. I never actually. I beat Dark Souls Three, but I never played the Ring City. And everyone always gets super angry at me for not playing the Ring City because it's apparently the pinnacle of the whole series. Is what I'm usually mm, told. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. And I mean, the boss fights are really hard. <laughs> Probably the hardest fights in, in a Souls game. Um, Dark Souls 3 is great, but it's more of the same. I think that's where it goes wrong. It's like the best of Dark Souls. I really enjoy it for what it is. It feels like a retread of Dark Souls 1. Because that's what it is. It's just more refined Dark Souls 1, which for me is fine. But I feel like... It, it just leaves me feeling a little bit underwhelmed after everything, mm. even though on paper, it's probably the best Souls game mechanically. Like the gameplay is fucking great. The boss fights are great. Um, I would say Ring City is worthwhile at some point, but um, probably just wait for Elden Ring now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. At why this not? point, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. I'm going to try to get through God of War before Elden Ring. I, you should really give that another shot. I mean, maybe just timing wise, the PC port is good. What, what GPU do you have? Uh, 2080 Super is pretty good. That's not bad, dude. That's a pretty mm. solid card. Um, you should be able to play that probably. Well, it has DLSS. Um, I'm playing, I have a 3090. I have like the big Bahama Mama. Oh, I fucking can, hell. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I got two of them actually. I'm spoiled. They mine when they mine crypto when I'm not gaming, but I can play that game full 4K native with ray trace, like everything. Actually, not ray, it doesn't have ray tracing, but with the max lighting for that game. And uh, not get stutters. Usually, even on a 3090, sometimes really good-looking games, I'll have to use DLSS to get a solid 60 frames. But God of War for a PC port is pretty solid. Is it capped at 60 or is it uncapped? No, it's uncapped. I cap it at 60 because I don't. my monitor doesn't have a higher than 60 hertz. That's, oh, like okay. a, that's the weak link in my visual setup. I need a new monitor. Mm. I just cap it at 60 because it doesn't matter for me. Yeah. Which helps. So maybe, maybe if I wanted 120... Um, I would have to maybe use DLSS or drop it. Until I got um, a new monitor, I did the same thing. I would always get scream, scream, screen tearing. Yeah. If I went over sixty, so VSync was always on for me, no matter the game. Yeah. But I've got a hundred sixty-five hertz monitor now, which is I hear they're worth it. Awesome. I, I need to make the plunge. I hear they're worth it. My setup sits comfortably in the fourteen forty p range. Like I can get decent frame rates with my card. I got a Ryzen nine. CPU and uh, 32 gigs of RAM because obviously do a lot of recording as well. Yeah. So um, it's pretty dope. However, I'm pretty sure they announced the 30 series like maybe a week after I built my computer. And I was like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> the timing. 
Could have got something better. It's fine though for what I need I need it to do, you know. Shouldn't be a problem. Runs everything. I keep my I just keep my car. For a while I've just been keeping my car. I used to sell I'd always just upgrade to the best one and then sell the old one because the resale value on the local listings was always pretty good. Mm. Then you meet cool like gamer dudes. I met a cool a few guys I gamed with by selling them old cards. But I've been keeping them and just mining with them now and just like buy a new one and then this i always just joke like you've been sent to the mines to die well you just work until you fall apart so i wouldn't stress too much about like not getting the best deal because whenever you do upgrade you can resell or have that card mine or something and you'll get i mean you can recoup a little bit of that like imperfect timing because there really yeah. is no per it's impossible to build the, like to time your pc build because mm. they they have it set up like on this running treadmill of ever better technology. They they know when it's time to release new shit. When you're most people are willing to, there's that's why they don't just put it all out there. They got to keep you coming next year for the next year and for the next year. And it is what it is, man. I think like this setup is not future proof, but will do me for the next few years before I need to upgrade. It's until so. you, yeah, until you either. For me, it's like well, first it's jumping to 4K. Like that requires, like if you really want to jump to 4K, because I'm also a frame rate Nazi. I hate having like basically locked perfect 60 FPS. I just hate it. Like I, I'll, I'll wait for a game. Like I'll, Sometimes if I buy a game and I can't play at max lock 60 FPS, that's fine. I'll just uninstall it. And when I upgrade my computer two years down the road, I'll come back and I'll just play it. Because there's so many games. Like my backlog... It's impossible unless it's like mm. Elden Ring or something where I don't care. I'll just find a way to play it. Dark Souls games are badly optimized, man. I can't get a stable 60. That There's always hitches between areas, always. And it used to drive yeah. me mental. Absolutely insane. Yeah, I, I, I hate it. I, I love when even like even like a little hitch when it's like loading a new screen or something. I'll notice it. Like, ah, Do you ah. have the uh, F FPS counter in game turned on? I had to turn mine off because I... Would always look yes, at it. Yes, it would hit your OCD. It piss you off. And I'd be like, "Oh, I dropped a frame there. Now I'm going to spend ten minutes in my settings <laughs> to figure out what it's I can so dial true. down." But I it's don't so want to true. compromise the graphics. So what else can I do? And then I find that I'm not enjoying what I'm playing because I'm obsessing over the, getting the best performance. Yeah. I get it though. I get it. Um, I get it. L yeah. Luckily, not really a concern I've had recently. But there are some games that are just so badly optimized. It's like. Are you yes. kidding me? It like, makes me super angry because it is a lot of it has not nothing to do with like how much horsepower. If a game's really optimized well, it'll run like Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. They run awesome on everything. Yeah, they're, everything. they're amazingly they're optimized. Amazing. I don't know if you've played it. Uh, another game engine that's incredible. Wh whatever they use for Sniper Elite. Three and four. Like People that love fucking, those games. I've never tried one. Uh, I bounced off of it, got really old really quick. However, runs incredibly well. Like, it's remarkable. Whatever that they're doing with that engine is optimized so well. And I, I respect that. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, because a lot of games, uh, admittedly, this was on PS5, but I bought the uh, GTA Definitive Collection day I've one. I've heard that was a train wreck. Yeah, it's slowly being fixed, but I've kind of lost interest now. But my God, like... So it launches on PS5 with a performance mode and a fidelity mode. And my initial question is, why am I having to pick between one or the other on, on a, a fucking... <laughs> PS5, How old is which that is, game? Yeah, I got a 20 year old game, whatever the fuck it is, 15, yeah. 13. Yeah. I mean, it's been remastered. It's got proper lighting now and it looks a lot better. But you're telling me they couldn't give, give me 4K 60. Like, what the fuck is going on there? Yes. So you choose performance mode and it's a joke. Uh, it's, it's dipping constantly, especially at nighttime. Like, there are games that look far better that can. Do uh you know perform way better? It's just I don't know what happened. I'm assuming it was rushed out the door to make money before Christmas, and uh, the backlash was phenomenal, like phenomenal. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're listening, they're patching it, but it's still a case of it shouldn't have released like that. It really shouldn't have. It was bad, and it, it crashes all the time, and it killed any desire I had to play. I was going to play GTA Three because. Uh, my parents bought me GTA 3 when I was 11, which was a bold decision. <laughs> uh, could have ended Very. badly. Could have yeah. turned into a maniac. However, 
you know, obviously didn't have any bad effects long term. I'm all good. Um, but I have a lot of nostalgia. That was the first time I experienced like a sandbox open world yeah. game where you can kind of just do whatever you want. And I used to just spend hours just doing anything, just using cheats and killing people. And it was yeah. great. And I was so ready to dive into that nostalgia again. And I was just so underwhelmed that I couldn't enjoy the game at all. And now I've just, it's been so long, it's probably never going to be played again. So Yeah, it's too bad. I was i was thinking about getting that, but I, I have, other than major, major releases, I've been burned by day one uh, PC releases enough. I just don't get anything day one. I did get Cyberpunk day one, which I didn't have any personal problems with it. Ran fine for me, uh, but not everyone had that experience and I'll get Elden no. ring day one. And I wasn't going to get God of war because I got horizon and days gone to Sony PC ports and they were okay. But horizon specifically, I was excited. Like, Ooh, what an awesome game to flex my 3090 and like get some real push some pixels. It was they badly were, optimized, wasn't it? Yeah. It, they uh, patched uh, it. I mean, it's better now. Mm. Uh, I've, I've redownloaded it since and it's better, but God of war is pretty damn solid. And it's not, it's not perfect, but like I'm, I'm not, I'm not angry. I bought it, and it's I think it's only 50, 50 bucks for forty bucks. It's not sixty dollar PC port. Oh uh, wow, yeah, that's uh, that's quite reasonable. I, I'll consider it. Like I liked it. I think just the story driven games. Um, I feel like their conviction to not cutting away from the action at any moment kind of compromised the gameplay in some areas. You know how it's one shot. It's yes. just it's one frame and it never changes. I feel like the game would be way better if you could pan the camera around like Dark Souls or something. Like I, I it annoys me that you can't that it's always fixed behind Kratos. It feels clunky to me. I know it gives you tells when you're being attacked from behind, but I to my understanding it's so that they could lock you in that perspective without you just moving the camera you around. You can Otherwise control be... the camera. You can move it around like a regular you, you, third person. You can't ever look behind you, right? Oh, oh is that yeah, because he turns. They always need yeah. Kratos in frame there so they can pan to the next like action shot. Yes, true, that, true. This is just a That's theory. That's why they have, the, uh, they have the quick turn mechanic for that, where you hit like arrow down and he does a 180. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's serviceable. It works. Yeah, I can see that. That is kind of weird. What, what I imagine happened is they were like, we want this to be one frame. You know, it's their artistic vision, like one shot. Yeah. But if the if the player is consistently looking behind them, how do we get them back into that perspective without it being jarring or just looking like a traditional uh, camera cut in any other game, yeah. right? So that's just my That's probably theory. why they did do that. That makes that actually makes a lot of sense. There's a really good documentary I've watched about the making of that game, and they may have, they may have brought that up. I do remember vaguely that they almost got rid of that creative decision multiple times because it was such a technical challenge to make that happen. Mm. And you could argue that like, you know, they could have spent time on other stuff and made the game, the game better. I'm excited for Ragnarok because they had already figured out the systems to solve all those problems in the first yeah. game. And maybe they can really tighten the second game up. I really like the combat. It's, it was good. The combat is good. That's a good point. When I, when I think about like the nostalgia, there are a few story elements that make me really nostalgic, but I just think about, oh God, the combat so good. The freaking, yeah. the Valkyrie boss. I mean, when I think of God of War, like the most nostalgic memory is getting, killing all the Valkyries, which are like the side bosses that are fucking hard. It's just like- I don't think I ever made it that far. I can't remember how far I got, but um, I, yeah. I, I did like it. I did. I just, um, I fell off of it. It might not have necessarily been the game's fault, but it's really good. Yeah. I do think it should have won Game of the Year. And there are times when I feel like it's one of the best games ever made. And I think creatively, whether you like all like the- the consequences of all those creative decisions. It's a technical marvel, that game that they put together. But I don't think, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I'm, as I'm replaying it, it's amazing. But, uh, and it's probably in my top, still a top. But I don't, did you ever play Last of Us 1 and 2? Uh, never played number two, played a little bit of one, didn't grab me. Didn't but grab again, you. it might not be the game's fault. I just, I'm, it's hard for me to, to really invest into a game without bouncing off. what single player experience like stories have have you uh like really got immersed in besides the ones we've already mentioned can you think of any uh silent hill 2 Ooh, 
That's going way back, though. That's going way. That's a good one, though. That's another great mm. one to play on emulator too. You can do some cool shit with that. I want to get the PC port somewhere. It's somewhere, isn't it? It was on PC. It's been one. patched, but um, I I didn't have any luck tracking it down. I don't really fuck with torrents or anything. Well, this is a weird one, I guess. Life is strange. I really like that. I haven't played it, but uh, it's obviously made a lot of circles and headlines. People love that game. Yeah, I uh, honestly never would have thought that I would enjoy it, but it's it's quite focused. There's a little bit of gameplay, so it's more involved than like, I don't know, I've never played the Telltale games. I think it's more involved. Okay. There's like a cool mechanic with uh, reversing time. And I think it, it does a really good character work in a video game, and I struggle to relate to characters or care about them in a video game. So that, that did really well for me. I wasn't expecting to get on with that, but I did. I gave it a chance. I, I don't know what else. Uh, I haven't really finished many games in a very long time. Demon Souls PS5 obviously had to play that. That was great. They've been saying Blue Point is uh, remaking Metal Gear Solid 1 for the PS5. That's a rumor that's been going around. Never played a Metal Gear game, so... <laughs> ay, ay, ay! Not I even on the PS1 back in the day? No, I never, I never had it. I, I, oh, no, I lied. I lied. I played Metal Gear Solid 2. I would have been like 11, 12. I, di- I didn't really understand stealth games or games mm. with cutscenes. <laughs> and that's a very weird... Metal Gear 2 is pretty wonky. There's some weird, really weird... Something about sometimes like Japanese humor doesn't translate to Western humor sometimes and just comes across mm. very weird. Um, and that was jarring for me because I was a little let down with Metal Gear 2 and I could see you. Like, I don't think Metal Gear 2, if you haven't played Metal Gear Solid 1, 2 is not the place to start. That's for sure. I'd, I'd never played a game like it. I used to play platformers, shooters, and fighting games. And for whatever reason, I had Metal Gear Solid 2. And I was like, what the fuck is this? With all this dialogue, cutscenes, sneaking around, stealth. What am I doing? I'm hiding. I never played anything like it. I, I only really got on with the stealth game when Splinter Cell came out. I enjoyed Ooh. that. Splinter Cell was cool. Yeah, I, I would probably like Metal Gear, but now it's like, where the fuck do you begin? And there's so much to the story yeah. That it's overwhelming. I would just wouldn't know how to approach that now. You would start with Twin Snakes on the GameCube, which is a remake of Metal Gear Solid 1 for mm. the GameCube. That's where you'd start. It's the most modernized version. It's going to respect your time more than Metal Gear Solid 1 is gameplay-wise. I mean, Hideo Kojima games are notorious for like bloated cutscenes and dialogue. So that's just part of what you're getting into if you try it. Have you made a video on uh, Psycho Mantis yet? I guarantee you that would that would do well. Oh yeah, because how he fucked my brain as an uh, just the whole the whole controller gimmick, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, well, he also reads your memory card, so yeah. I I remember he I was way into this JRPG series called Sui Coden, like super like hardcore J like weeb shit, and you have to be like it's not even that popular in that genre. It's kind of like a cult classic in that genre. It's not a big mm. seller. And uh, I didn't even understand the concept of like a memory card or whatever. So to me, I felt like the dude was psychic when he was like, oh, you like Sui Code. And he starts rambling off stats about my gameplay of Sui Code because it's reading my memory card and knows like hmm. how many hours I've played, how many characters I've gotten. And it freaked me out because I also grew up extremely religious, like borderline cult. Like I, 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 I use the word high demand religion because it's a nicer way of saying it. And my parents did have some strong beliefs about like the appearances of evil and video games. I had some superstition kind of. And <laughs> I first, for like a split second, I was wobbling like, is this game like actually demonic? Yeah, it freaked me out. That was a very, and then yeah, swapping the controller out. That ex- experience in and of itself might be probably the pinnacle experience of that game. Obviously, I didn't really play it when it came out, but games breaking the fourth wall like that. And it's it's unheard of, really, or it was. Still fairly uncommon now. Did you ever play um, Eternal Darkness? Yeah. Are you familiar with that? That's yeah. I, that's considered... I haven't played it... Well, I should say, I haven't played it. I've watched a bunch of videos on it because I love video games. But I think that's considered like the GOAT of fourth wall breaking, like the, the standard, you know what I mean? Top tier experience. It fucks with you based on like, if, if you've lost your sanity within the game 
Um, it will play tricks on you. Like there's there's one trick it does where it fakes deleting your save data <laughs> entirely, which is really funny. But th- then there are some that haven't held up because uh, this was of an age of like CRT TVs and uh, it will mess with the screen or like a little volume thing will go down on your TV. But for the time, very cool stuff. And then there's yeah. moments where you'll walk into a room and you're, all your limbs will fall off. And you'll be like, what the fuck? And then it'll just suddenly come to and you'll be like, oh, I've gone insane. It kind of wears off quick, but I, I remember that leaving quite an impression with yeah. me. But you should definitely do a TikTok about Psycho Mantis. I'm sure a lot of... Um, I should. Probably a lot of Metal Gear fans that would be like, fuck yeah, Psycho Mantis. But there's also... I imagine like some of the people that follow you are quite young as well and didn't grow up with the PlayStation True. 1 stuff. So yeah. it's it's definitely a, a very interesting thing for Metal Gear to do. It's... it's the only thing that I know of that happens in Metal Gear 1, Psycho Mantis. It is That's all probably I the coolest. I mean, there's other cool spots, but like the most memorable, and definitely that impacted me the most was was that moment. I've been playing through it of the PS1. It's a game that I've thought about doing a full a full playthrough all the way with all the emulation settings. Like It's just really hard to record because I'm, I'm too much of a perfectionist to record through an entire game and not have any like cuts and make it look like because i can't sit through and play the whole game without dying and i want to i wanted to be like a perfect playthrough of metal gear with all the best emulation settings at 60 frames interpolated like all that awesome stuff it's just too much of a i started trying it i'm like this would be like a two-year project the yeah. way i'm doing it. it's impossible so i gave up but i i, I try not to use any footage uh, i don't i try not to rip any footage off of youtube i try it to be all my own footage, the highest quality. It's like, well, if I have, what's the point of having a 3090 if I can't like use it, right? What do you use to capture stuff on PC? So I use OBS and I have like all the bit rates and everything set to max. My file, and I record at nat- native 4K. If the game runs in 60, I'll do it 4K 60. What I try to do with PlayStation games is I'll figure out the like the native frame rate of the game and I'll set my frame rate to match what the game runs at. That helps with just certain things in post, being with file size and certain things in post. Yeah. I go through a lot like to try to keep my foot because ultimately the idea is all this footage is going to end up on YouTube where I can have it uncompressed in 4K. Obviously, for TikTok, it gets compressed down, but I've done some A-B testing where like, I just grab something off YouTube versus emulating it myself, and my footage does... It is sharper, and it does pop better. So I think it's worth it, and it's I have that all cataloged on a hard drive for youtube content where it will actually be shown in 4k as well so yeah it's just worth having as well yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, i'm sure the purists will be like oh this game was never meant to be shown there's in 4k there's a lot of people that get angry and there's a lot of people that say like certain mods and texture haps uh look like shit and i'm just like okay don't use them then like yeah. the original still there like- i did one for mario because there's a mario 64 pc port unofficial where they back engineered mario 64 to be a native pc port which is blown open modding i saw that yeah i, I played that <clears throat> on uh, on release but um obviously way before texture mods or anything yes <laughs> looks it's, really really it's been awesome. about two years i got it too right when it came out but now that it's been two years there's like a there's some nice builders that are they're not too hard to put together. Like you kind of just pick the mods you want and it'll compile it, put it in the right order. And uh, yeah, there's some cool, and a lot of people, a lot of people like that video. And then uh, Nintendo fans though, like hardcore Nintendo cult fans, like they get really, really uppity. I've noticed like out of all the videos I do, it's if it's a Nintendo like mod, like the Mario Kart 64 mod got a lot of these comments, the 64 Mario. I did a Star Fox one with a texture mod the Nintendo fans, like, they just, they're passionate. That's what I'll say. Very passionate. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah. I guess, I, I don't know, showing my age a bit, but, you know, if I don't agree with an aesthetic choice or a mod, I'm just like, oh, it's not for me. Well, they, they, yeah. they can't do away with the original, but I guess that's more of a an adult mindset, I guess. Like, I've, I've never been compelled to leave an angry TikTok comment or be like, you've ruined this, or this isn't what it was supposed to be. Like, I've told this story cares? before, um, but I think it's worth telling again just because you might find it funny. The, I was just say this. The most angry anyone's gotten is over 
when I first got AI interpolation software, I was playing with sprites. I would download like the sprite animations from fighting games, put them together in an editor, render that, and then interpolate that up to 60 frames just to like kind of see how close it would look. And most hmm. ex- most of the experiments were pretty like shitty. Like it, the software, you get these weird warps and it just doesn't look that good. But I did find yep. uh, Street Fighter Third Strike because those were kind of the tail end of the heyday of sprite animation. They're bigger sprites. They have more resolution. They have more frames per second. So there's more data for the algorithm to try to interpolate the frames. Yep. And they, I thought they actually looked pretty good. And I posted a test animation of Ryu doing some moves. And a lot of people liked it. But man, a lot of people got legitimately angry to the point where a dude started DMing me threats about like artistic integrity and sprites and respecting artists and uh, it was kind of like what the fuck he was just one but i would say in general the most negative comments i've gotten was when i interpolate any like sprite animation from street fighter i've done two videos and both of them just a higher percentage of people were angry than normal i just can't imagine getting that upset over (laughs) sprite animations like you're not doing any harm. Like you're posting a video. Like you're not tampering with the artist's original work or vision. It's just a little project. Like who cares, really? I guess. I don't know, um, man. I identify with video games. I like them, but I guess not at that same level. I suppose. I mean, maybe if you felt a creative bond with Street, I, I mean, um, or you just, I don't know what it is. Like people, I think most of the sentiment comes from. I think people miss the old school sprite animation and they're like, everything's moved to 3d and like Pixar and CGI. And I think there might be a little bit of like, they miss it. And then they see something they love. That's like leftover relic getting computerized and interpolated. And it just pisses them off because it's, it's a dying art form. Or is I it get the same it? people that hate horror movie remakes that are like, how dare they Yeah, remake that? You Did you know, ever see Cabin like- in the Woods, by the way? Yeah, I thought that was a decent movie, yeah. It was interesting because it appears to be a very like generic horror yes, movie it to begin with. It begins with, it kind of pulls a bait and switch on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah and then yeah. it becomes a very, very interesting. It's very cool. I, I love horror movies. In my mind. Yeah, you brought up horror movies, and I've, I'm moderately into them. I know people get way into horror movies. I'd love to hear your recommendations. But that's one that I liked because it was like comedy and horror. Yeah, it, um, it didn't take itself too seriously. It knew it had a very uh, silly premise. And I like that it subverted your expectations. And I, I like that. I can't spend a while since I've seen it, but I like the one guy that um, he was smoking weed, but it was keeping him unaffected by whatever yeah. like he ends hormone up being, was the in the air. head becomes right. He has been calling it the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. just pointing out how everyone's just being dumb and acting <laughs> like they're in a horror movie. It's it's very meta. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I t- I t- I'm a big horror fan, but um, as for stuff I've watched recently... Yeah, what would you recommend? Besides the classics that I've probably already heard of. Like something new. M- Malignant. I watched that. That was Malignant. batshit insane. Uh, so James Wan horror movie. He did The Conjuring. Oh, I have heard um, about this. Uh, the problem is I... I don't know about you. I used to be like really a- like hardcore... Not necessarily atheist after being related religious but i did not believe in ghost stories at all yeah and now i kind of do and so th- uh, those kind of movies fuck with me a little bit because they can really get in my head but i still enjoy it so the thing is like i watched insidious some people think this is weird i have astral traveled four times by following the protocol i don't know if it's real meaning like you you actually do it or it's just in your head like you go into a mm. dream state but I followed the Monroe Institute, Monroe Institute protocol. It's a series of binaural beats. You go through a bunch of tracks and breathing exercise. You can have the experience. I don't know if it's actually real. Again, like I've had lots of crazy experiences on psychedelics. Is that just in my head or is it real? I don't know. But yeah. I know I know you can be sober, follow protocol, and either actually astral travel or have some sort of dream or experience that's like astral traveling. And that movie freaked me out. So James Wan and I, I'm kind of like, I don't know if I can handle him, dude. He he got got me a little freaked out a couple of times before. I don't, I really don't want to ruin anything in Malignum, but I will say I I doubt there's anything in that movie that will feel so close to home as astral projection. I really okay. doubt it. 
it's it's insane and it's not what you think it's going to be um i was really impressed with it but it's, it's also very divisive i've seen a lot of people hate it it's it's a bonkers movie like it's just it's silly it's silly fun don't take it too seriously uh it's just a lot of fun and i can't really say anything without ruining it so i won't okay yeah it'd be like you can't talk about cabin in the woods without ruining it yeah yeah okay. well basically you'd sell it as uh a generic cabin in the woods horror movie wouldn't you yeah you can't really talk about the stuff that makes it unique yeah yeah malignant i've heard people talk about this yeah what's the next one not a movie uh and not strictly horror i guess it is uh just come out on netflix archive 81 watched that yesterday it's a uh, conspiracy slash occult you have thriller me. horror sold sold it's conspiracy cool. occult thriller i'll take it basically guy has to uh he's been hired to restore a bunch of videotapes that were burned in a fire and he's unraveling a mystery as he's doing it he's paid by some strange guy a lot of money mysterious benefactor yes that needs these tapes and it's all about unraveling the mystery of what's on the tapes why are they so important to this man what is he going to discover and uh, i actually binge the entire thing in one day so <laughs> yeah eight episodes nice. i smashed it out yesterday because i had nothing better to do and i've been off work as well so i was like fuck it why not <laughs> that was really good um otherwise i'll tell you a movie not to watch uh old by m night Shyamalan. yeah i saw it in theaters uh, interesting premise terrible acting and dialogue just um, got really awful. cool premise everything else god awful yeah, they botched the execution. Just stupid, dumb movie. It felt like a Twilight Zone episode. And for a while I was along for the ride, but then I was just I lost interest. And I think that the acting was terrible. It was so bad. I mean, we were in the theater, so we finished it. And I did want to see what the twist does, because he always has a twist. And I was like, okay, mm. you've sold me on the premise. I did, I guessed government instead of the actual truth, but the, I pretty much figured the premise out by the end of the movement. I just guessed like the one of the labels of an organization wrong yeah there's a scene at the end where a guy very awkwardly explains the entire plot twist yes just so everyone at home even though everyone at the end of the movie no they know what's going on like we're supposed to believe this is a tried and true practice that they do so it really fell flat but i was enjoying it just for the absurdity of it i suppose and then i was like this is so stupid it was pretty bad like, he's lost his touch man he had a few Obviously, Six Sense was was good, mm, and then very I, thought, good. I thought Unbreakable was pretty decent. I even and I thought Split, the first one in Split, was pretty decent. Split was good. Split was a return to form for him. Yeah. It was very very good. So he's. I always check his shit out because he is consistently good enough. Uh, I liked. I personally liked The Village. A lot of people hated that. But I, I liked it. Yeah. yeah, decent. Yeah. You ever seen The Happening? No, I heard that one was terrible though. It's funny. But basically, there's like a pheromone in the air that causes people to commit suicide. It's very stupid. Very, very stupid. It's kind of like bird. I like the bird box idea where it's like there's like these invisible demons that drive people insane. That was pretty cool. I like the idea. I didn't like the execution of that movie. I think they made a big mistake um, opening up the movie with like present day. So you know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I, th- I think it's Sandra Bullock, Bullock. and her yeah, yeah. two kids. Trying to and escape. so yeah. when when we go back to like what happened before, although it was cool to see everything unfold, I'm presented with a an issue where I'm like, well, I know what's going to happen. Everyone's going to die because this happened in the past and in the future we're following Sandra and her two kids. It, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it, it didn't really land for me. It was uh, an interesting idea. I like... Stuff that leans into cosmic horror, um, you know, look, looking at something and going insane is very Lovecraft, very Bloodborne, isn't it? Just yes. like the idea of not being able to um, perceive what you were looking at, it being so alien to you that it makes you lose your mind because you can't even comprehend what you're looking at. I love, I love that, that concept. Yeah, with that level, I think it's the Mensis Nightmare, I believe it's called, where they have mm. the big brain, you get close to the brain, you get your friend, I think it's Frenzy. Yeah, Fre- Frenzy is basically what I described in a mechanic. It's you're going insane because you yeah. cannot comprehend. 
I, I've always liked how gameplay mechanics are like baked into the lore and stuff as well. Ooh, I want to talk about that with God of War, but it would ruin shit. But tell you what, I'll uh, I'll give it a go. I've I've still got the PS5 uh, PS4 version. I believe it got updated. I think there is a PS5 some sort of performance mode patch or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. I I wouldn't lose anything from giving it another go, and also it would look and play a lot better than it did. So. Yeah. I think that's another reason why I didn't get on with it. It made my PS4 sound like it was <laughs> going to the moon. Like it really was so Strings loud. It. Yeah. Yeah. That, that pushed the, that console to the limit 100%. Mm. Uh, I mean, it was a fairly stable 30 FPS, but holy crap, did it make some noise. Yep. It was bad. What, what is it I say? Well, I don't, people say this. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I have to remind myself yeah. every time I do something new, that uh, it's an opportunity and there's nothing to be afraid of. And if, if you don't push yourself, you'll always be in the same place. And uh, I just want to say, like, I really appreciate you inviting me on. Like, you're a lot bigger a creator on TikTok, so I wasn't expecting it. I've really enjoyed it and uh, it's been very awesome yeah, to man. talk to you. I don't often get to nerd out about video games, so that's fucking awesome. That I've been able to talk to you about Dark Souls and other things for like three hours. Yeah. That's what we do here. You've really thrown me a bone uh, helping me out because, um, you know, you're a bigger creator than I am and I really appreciate it. And uh, I think uh, we've had a... Well, I'm not that big of a creator. And two, I'd, uh, it's a win-win. I, I do... It is kind of weird. It's, it is hard to get people on the podcast who are bigger because it's like, what value? So I also legitimately think your music... I mean, I messaged you. Like, holy shit. Like, this is fucking heavy. I like... I. I sent it to a couple of homies. You make dope shit, man. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I've really enjoyed doing this. So I was slightly terrified, even though uh, nothing to be scared of, really. But yeah, no. it's been uh, it's been really cool. Um, I've never been on a podcast before. So here's to that, I guess. We just got to have you back on whenever your your uh, album's done. Either, either yeah. or album. That would be um, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Would love to, yeah. I've been trying to get more music musicians on. I find that there's a pretty strong overlap with musicians and video games. Most musicians at least casually play games. Most most I find are pretty into gaming. Like you, they at least have one or two series that they like that's gotten them by the balls in the past. It's, it's a pretty mm. good overlap. Um, I just figured like, okay, I like music. I like video games. It's just if I can bring people on who talk about the same shit. If I have an enjoyable, enjoyable conversation, then the idea would be that the listener... It's going gonna, it's gonna to be enjoyable. As long as we have a good time, they should have a good time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think we've had a pretty good and broad uh, chat. Yeah. You know, talked a lot about music. Are your Let's Plays still up on YouTube? Yeah, if you search Andrew Malefice, um, there's a Andrew whole bunch of Malefice. content on there. I, if anyone has, you know, checked out this podcast, like I, I did used to do Let's Plays. I'm still due to do the finale of Dark Souls 1, I was uh, going through that game again. It's been an ongoing project over the last two years. I feel like I'm either going to have to start a new channel or I'm going to jump ship entirely, but I don't know. I've been focusing on TikTok. That There is a, an archive of uh, gaming videos that I've made, some shorter stuff, some stuff more like Video Game Donkey, and then there's, you know, Let's Plays, and then there's, like, reviews. So if that sounds like you might enjoy it, you can check that out but again i don't know what the future holds because uh basically I, I just bounced unannounced three months ago i was like i don't want to do this for a while and then i think it's to do with the fact tiktok's going really well youtube is just going terribly it's like brutal. my views are yeah. terrible I, I did a content 180 is what i call it where I started doing one thing. I accumulated my subscribers doing one thing and then i was like i'm not going to do that anymore i'm going to do this other thing and so my like audience cross through like subscriber click through rate is like 1% of like mm. 4,000, which is shit. So my views are shit. And I, I spend <laughs> a lot of time. It's not about views. It isn't. It's fun. And I, I do think I will go back to it in some capacity. I'm just figuring out what I'm going to do. Let's plays on it though. They're such a commitment. They are such a commitment. Uh, people don't watch them. Not the way to grow on YouTube anymore, but um, yeah. I do feel like... You're doing the right thing, man. Just focus on... I mean, look, it is not about views, but it's also... It's impossible as a human being to stay motivated if you're not getting some positive reinforcement. That's why video games give you levels up and better loot and better HP. That's how we're wired. 
And so mm. if, they, if the algorithm, if they, if they want you to make content that they can monetize and whatever, it's like TikTok's doing it the best. And I, it's not going to last forever, but I think you're doing the right thing. It's going to get your music out. It's going to open more doors. So I would say just crank that until it stops. It's because whatever's working, do it until it stops working. And then adapt from there. And it, the TikTok is working. It's like how I, I mean, I found your music. I listened to it. I put it on a couple of playlists of my own. I sent it to a couple of people. How many more people like me are like that? And how many, and then that just, every time you do more videos, that, that just happens more and more and more. And blah, and just, yeah, it's, um, it's constantly growing. And uh, that's not something I ever experienced on YouTube. In fact, I experienced a lot of like, I've spent 12 hours editing this video and it got 30 views. Yep. <laughs> and I'm not entitled to anything, but I do feel like there comes a point where it's just soul destroying after a while. It's like, I don't think the issue was my content. I think I started to get into the stride of commentary and I started to edit more and it became more about goofs and gags and memes, but no one was watching because my channel was cursed. So I've kind of lost the will to do it, but I think I might start from scratch providing I have time. But like you were saying, like I have to go with whatever avenue is like the most fruitful and that is TikTok. And I'm a better musician than I am a YouTuber because I've been doing YouTube two years on and off. Yeah. But I've been playing guitar for 19 years. So I feel like the limited time that I have, I need to focus on the thing that's going to yield the best results, which ideally is like getting my Spotify plays up, my monthly listeners, uh, getting a lot of traction on the new single that will cross over into a new album and announcing yeah. a new band and getting similar traction and just, you know, from strength to strength, that's the plan. YouTube has just been uh, a grind and it hasn't been very fulfilling. And I mean, I've had some positive reception on there. I've had some videos do well, but it, that algorithm is just sadistic. It's, it's so yeah. hard to deal with, especially when you confuse them by being a channel that does one thing and then completely shifting what you do and YouTube doesn't know. It's just like, for whatever reason, this guy's subscribers do not watch his content. So we're not going to ever help him out, basically. That's my understanding. I might be wrong. I might make uh, complete shit. I don't know. I, I did once ask. I was like, is my stuff shit? But I didn't really get a response. So, <laughs> Well, so Andrew Malefice, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, everywhere the same, right? The, uh, Andrew Malefice, YouTube, Andrew Malefice, Instagram, The Mensis Ritual, TikTok. Uh, it's a little oh. bit confusing. Yes, The Mensis Ritual, TikTok. I'm not on Twitter. I don't know why I mentioned that. I deleted it recently because it's I hate it so much. Where else am I? I think that's it. But yeah, the riffs, Instagram, Andrew Malefice, and TikTok, The Mentis Ritual. Check out my band, The Mentis Ritual. Stay tuned for uh, a new project and a new album this year and uh, a new single from The Mentis Ritual this year called God Cursed. It's going to be very, very cool. You like gaming videos, have a look on my YouTube. You might find something you like. And if not, no sweat, because I'm probably packing it in. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. You have it, folks. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks very much, man. Take care.